Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another day here at the Damage Report. I'm John Arola, very lucky to be joined today on the program by the one, the only, Wazni Lambre. Wazni, how's it going? I'm good, man. Very happy to be back. How are you guys? Uh, we've been good. I mean, we haven't, but that's what you're supposed to say. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, I, I have, I guess, something to look forward to in, in, in for the first time in a while. I uh, normally, by the time we get to this point in the day where we're doing the show, um, I drink coffee during the show. I always go decaf. I think I might have accidentally went caffeinated. So, you know, something to look forward to. <laughs> but anyway, um, you've been uh, adventuring off way out there, New York City. How does it feel uh, to be uh, returning to LA? You've missed so much flash mobs and all that. <laughs> you know it's crazy cuz I hadn't been in New York all summer and if you've ever lived in New York you know basically all the pain and suffering and subway super rats and the terrible weather the payoff is supposed to be all the reverie that takes place during the summer here in New York City and so I hadn't been here all summer so it's cool to be a part of the energy in New York, even amidst you know the pandemic and mm -hmm. all these other crises, uh, New Yorkers are still finding a way to to power through. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Um, okay, we've got a lot that we're gonna be talking about through the course of the next 90 minutes. Of course, we're gonna be starting uh, with Afghanistan. It is obviously significant. We're gonna be uh, looking back uh, over two decades of, uh, of war. We've got a congressperson calling for political violence and then swearing that's not what he's doing. Who is it? Stay tuned to find out. Uh, and then we got a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, you know, the elimination of uh, enhanced unemployment benefits during the pandemic. That's another disaster for a country that hardly needed one. Um, people being harassed, walking their dogs, always fun. There's a lot coming up. We'll even be talking about uh, vaccine mandates and professional sports. Are they like peanut butter and chocolate or peanut butter and relish? We're gonna have a debate a little bit later on. But anyway, as we go through those topics, if you wanna send us uh, tweets, comments, super chats, all that, we'll respond as we go. And uh, before we get started, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, sharing the stream, that would be a delight. With that said, Wozni, you ready to jump into things? Yes, sir. Okay, let's do it. We're out, America is out of Afghanistan, at least for now. American diplomats have left the country. The US Embassy is gonna remain closed, despite an announcement earlier this year that it would remain open even after we left the country. The military has now completed its withdrawal. For the first time since 2001, there are no US soldiers in the country. Although I will add, supposedly. <laughs> I mean, okay, there's not 5,000 soldiers. Mm, you believe no CIA, no nothing, okay, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, at least the formal withdrawal has now been completed. It, it does leave, especially because it appears to have been concluded a little bit early on the deadline. As many as 200 American citizens and tens of thousands of Afghans were left behind during this airlift that the Secretary of State calls one of the largest evacuation efforts in US history. Secretary of State demanded that the Taliban keep its word and allow them to leave safely once they had exit documents in hand. And so 200 American citizens, many other allied Afghans being left behind. More than 123,000 people were evacuated from Kabul over the past couple of weeks, including about 6,000 American citizens. So there's a lot going on, obviously, Wazdi. I don't know, you've been away, so I don't know how much time you've had to talk about this. Uh, it's a it's the end to a very significant, almost entirely dark chapter in American history. Yeah, what I would want uh, the viewers of TYT to um, remember most about all of this is 20 years, two trillion dollars spent um, propping up this government, the Afghanistan government, and that thing fell down like a pile of bricks in seven days. Mm -hmm. Seven days, 20 years, tens of thousands of Afghans died. Um, numerous American soldiers died. 
Uh, and that government fell in seven days. It's yeah. pathetic. And so when you see these guys go on the cable news shows, or they pin their little op eds in the Washington Post and Politico and all these other places, and they're talking about why and how we should stay there permanently. Just remember that, and also remember that, <laughs> you know, on Dick Cheney's first tax return after the war, he reported twenty million dollars in income from his position at Halliburton. Like that's what he reported to the IRS. So God only knows how much money him and his cronies in the defense industry made off of this endless war that never had any points to it, never had any merits. Uh, It's just, it's awful. Yeah, you hear, uh, you know, Trump and other Republicans have been focusing on this eighty-four billion dollars in military equipment that that the Taliban's taking control of. Like, I feel like they keep saying that number. Because they don't want you to think about the fact that like they're pretending they're mad about the hardware, but their buddies already got paid for. They got paid years ago yeah. for it. That 84 billion, that's been invested. They put it in Doge. They've made a whole bunch more money. Like they all got paid. They're like they're frustrated because there's an AR-15 that some Taliban dude has now, as if they didn't already have enough guns. They already made that money. And so Trump turns around earlier just yesterday and says we should reinvade to get those guns, okay, maybe that's why. But if we were to do that, you'd be spending billions more on the reinvasion. So it's it's a like as you point out, it's a tragedy in so many ways. Obviously, the lives lost, including even recently with that the U.S. drone strike killing so many members of that one family, but thousands and thousands and thousands of people on top of the money that we focus on so much, and for what? For you know, some groups to have two decades where they weren't being as universally, um, you know, victimized by the Taliban, but now we're worried about that same system returning. Yeah, of course. And and again, what's most important to understand is that this could never work. This was never going to be a winnable war in the traditional sense. There was under no circumstances were we ever going to win Afghanistan from the Taliban. We took over the major city and the rest of the country, which you know, most of the country is extremely rural, was ruled by the Taliban the entire time, right? Like they never left. We kicked them out of Kabul and they just went back to the countryside and they maintained a constituency over there. And there was no way we were ever going to infiltrate that. And we've known that for like 15 years now. But you know, the business of the defense industry still has to be maintained, right? And so yeah. we're building roads in a country where most of these people ride on horseback and donkey. Um, we're training the Afghani military. People get paid to do all of this stuff. American dollars go into paying for all of this stuff. And yeah. for what? For nothing. There's no actual goal but to line these people's pockets. That's the to me, that's the craziest part about all of this is that anybody with half a mind knew that like they could just assess the situation and be like, we can't win this. That's yeah. not we, well, we, there's no reason to be here. And and look, I think there there are some, you know, good hearted people that like it's devastating. Like, cause you want you want to help. You want you know you want women to be able to go to college courses. Like, you want these things. And and even and first of all, there's a couple of major issues with that. One is that uh, the people who actually just want what's best for the Afghan people. There's mm. even then there's like a lot of like cultural imperialism tied in there, yeah. and I don't think that they necessarily want Walmart and McDonald's and all that. But but I get that you want that you want them to have the right to have a job and all that. But those people are not the ones who are in charge at any point under any administration over 20 years. There might be some regular people. I don't even think that there's necessarily a lot of Americans like that. But they certainly weren't the ones calling the shots. That sort of rhetoric might have been employed. The idea of we want to make purple thumbs and we want people to have rights. But that's not why we went in. That's not why we stayed. And so it's good to be inspired by that. There's far too few people that want what's best even for their fellow American, let alone are willing to take those progressive values and apply them to people around the world. That usually it stops at our borders. But let's also bear in mind that that's not what was going on over this this period of time.
Come on, John, let's, let's be serious. I'm in New York City right now. We could invade Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Those Hasidic women don't go to college. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this idea that all we want is for, you know, Amish women to go to college. Like people are allowed to do whatever they want within their culture. It's not really on us to come in and be like, well, these are the American expectations of women, et cetera, et cetera. Like these people have to want it for themselves. Um, it's not on us to go in and sort of impose our will. Let those people yeah. do what they want, how they want. Like these, these factions have been warring for literally thousands of years. And the idea that the US could just come and wave a magic wand and quote unquote solve all of their problems, or just like you said, John, the idea that that's why we went there in the first place yeah. is just laughable. Yeah, and, and bear in mind, like, you know, obviously, as I always say, I make these comparisons a lot, as I always say, it's very different degrees, but like, you know, like we're we're trying to get like we we've been focusing on women. Obviously, this is not the only the only issue here, but we've been focusing on the rights of women in Afghanistan. Men, Tucker Carlson was doing like a monologue mocking pregnant female service members like a day ago. <laughs> like as I've alluded to, one in five Americans think uh, interracial marriage is immoral now, not a hundred years ago. Like they're they they like attacking transgender athletes. Has been the rallying cry of the right all year. So, you know, glass ideological houses, I think. But anyway, let's um, let's move into another phase of this. Uh, the U.S. has pulled out of Afghanistan. Uh, the domestic news war, the narrative war, continues though. And um, you know, like I think there's a lot of reasons to be frustrated with basically every part of how this was handled. I think there should be a measure of understanding that it was never going to be clean. Um, but anyway, the most recent uh, form of uh, you know, criticism of President Biden and his uh, influence over this withdrawal uh, was twofold. In the first part, uh, it became like a whole news cycle that he wasn't going to uh, see the return of the bodies from abroad, the, the 13 uh, who died in Afghanistan. That was actually a lie, it wasn't true at all. but. That didn't stop it from being a whole news cycle for a day. But anyway, once he did meet with those families, now you have a round of uh, screenshots like this. Headlines like, I hope you burn in hell. Apparently it was what one of the, the relatives said uh, to Joe Biden. And uh, and I get it, you know, there there probably are a lot of family members of those of those who died who are enraged rightfully. And honestly, I think that the media doesn't focus enough on the devastating impact of these deaths, like unless it's incredibly politically beneficial to a particular outlet. And so I get it, Wozni. Um, and so now I'm seeing this everywhere. I don't know about you, but like the, the the meetings that Biden had, there's a lot of anger about it. Look, it's it's far be it for me to tell somebody who just lost a loved one where to direct their anger, but you know. In a, in a perfect world, I think anger would be directed at three other people, uh, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump. <laughs> All people who had opportunities to get the hell out of Afghanistan years ago, a de over a decade ago, and didn't. You know, the cleanest way to exit Afghanistan would to have never been in that damn place in the first in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I, I wish we would direct more of our ire to previous leaders. Who I'm I'm sorry, man. You got to give it up to Joe Biden. He's doing something that is politically brave. Um, these all of these armchair generals and fear mongers are gonna go on cable news. They're gonna take out their op eds. They're gonna attack him for doing the right thing. Um, and he's the one that did it. Trump didn't yeah. do it. Barry paid lip service to it. And God knows George Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld had no interest in not continuing this forever war. So, uh, you know, Joe Biden is the bravest of the bunch. Yeah, yeah, and that doesn't mean that how he did it can't be criticized. For sure, um, but like they are definitely, and I'll, they hear, I, I love wasting time and saying pointless things, so I'll do that. Um, does anyone actually think that if it was still Trump and ISIS K blew up a car bomb and killed 13 service members, that Sean Hannity would be calling for Trump to resign? Does anyone actually think that? Nobody thinks that. Nobody at all thinks that. But that's what they're that's what they're using it for here. And and again, like if you're one of the family members, you should totally totally be angry. But as Wazi said, you should be angry at all of the ones who who led us there. And and I can point out a little bit of 
it seems weird. Like, so a couple of the family members were on um, with Sean Hannity criticizing Biden. Sean Hannity doesn't give a damn about those soldiers. Sean Hannity was cheerleading us into that war. He would have been perfectly happy for us to stay there for the next 500 years. Like, who thinks Sean Hannity was like all for withdrawal? He really is just not interested in this military industrial complex and imperialism thing. That seems weird. Um, so anyway, yeah, like be be frustrated by with Biden. Honestly, like if it if I actually thought it was starting a trend of us like levying some sort of consequences for our political leaders when they get us into horrible situations like this, then I would be even more for it. Um, in this case, it seems like the media, it seems like some are just really angry that we're actually pulling out. Um, so anyway, that that's frustrating. <laughs> anyway, look, I wanna I wanna go to a little bit of video so you can get an idea of how the other side is talking about this. Because again, they're gonna some are gonna say that they're for the withdrawal, but they have to make it a thing where they can attack Biden for. So here's a bit of the five. It isn't about the military. This was not a successful airlift. I'm sorry, it wasn't. We 120,000. I mean, no, this is the worst military operation I've ever seen, and it had nothing to do with the military. It had to do with a government that let them down. We are the greatest military uh, uh, on earth, and we are at the. We have to rely on the Taliban. Just putting that sentence together makes you sad. And I, 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 I we know lost that we have war, dude. I know we did. Oh, I, I know that. And, I, and by the way, I'm very happy that we're getting out of there. But we cannot forget how awful this was. And how it let down a lot of people for, for there are a lot of veterans who are looking at this and they're sick to their stomach. And I, I think the idea of saying how successful this is, we're polishing a turd. Yeah, I agree. Polishing a turd. Yeah. Yeah, and so like you're gonna see a lot of that. Like, no, I'm totally for the withdrawal and everything, but like this is the worst operation ever. Like <laughs> I, I feel like Wazni has a pretty good grasp of like American foreign policy. This is the worst one. Like, I mean, didn't it, Trump start his presidency with that like that bungled raid into Yemen? Like, I don't know. Like, feel free, jump jump in. I with mean, those. that seems like a know, weird one. Look, listen, we we were sending people into Iran to to try to topple that regime back in the '60s um, and the '50s. People who didn't speak Farsi. Okay, <laughs> like, could you imagine somebody trying to come in and topple the American government who couldn't speak English? <laughs> like, it just doesn't, it doesn't even compute. Like, the the, the number of foreign policy blunders um, in the past 100 years, like, I, I think people would be shocked to know how many screw ups there actually have been. Right? I think the reason why you get a movie like um, franchise like The Born Identity or the Tom Clancy nonsense is to like sort of propagandize us into thinking that the CIA and the intelligence services are these hyper competent, hyper intelligent, hyper athletic, hyper everything people. When in reality, they're just a bunch of screw ups and have been screwing up from the inception of that um, agency. Uh, that being said, what I noticed this homie doesn't talk about is like, oh, we got to rely on the Taliban again. As I said at the beginning of the show, the government, the Afghani government that we spent 20 years and $2 trillion on propping up failed in seven days. That's why we're at the mercy of the Taliban to get out of there. The government that the United States military, the United States government tried to prop up for 20 years failed in seven days. Yeah. That's why there's this catastrophe at the airport, okay? Like if not, it would be a, a quote unquote friendly government being like, all right guys, you did your job, it's so great. <laughs> We're self-sufficient now, you can go. The reason why that's not happening is because the war has been a complete and utter failure disaster. That's what exactly. that homie's not talking about in that clip. Yeah, although I gotta say like, I'm at least glad that they are technically talking about a thing that is really happening in the world. <laughs> like they're not talking about Dr. Seuss and all that for a little bit. Like, good. Like honestly, Greg Gutfeld, that's your best performance ever. Please continue talking about the real world. And look, if you if you can actually inspire your crazed conspiracy theory, believe in base, to actually honestly be against military adventures by the U.S. government, good, good. Of course, if Tom Cotton is the the nominee next time around, they'll be cheering for an invasion of Iran. So I don't actually think that's going to happen, but I would love to see it. 
Anyway, uh, we are going to take our first break and really mix things up after this. We're gonna be talking about Madison Cawthorn, some of his recent comments about January 6th and uh, the electoral path, path forward for the right, but first this. Okay, a lot of messages coming in. Let's see if uh, how many we can get to. First of all, Mass Space Debater became a tier one member on YouTube. Thank you for that. I look forward to very carefully reading your messages in the future. Uh, Vicky Gray, thank you for the super sticker. Uh, Little Fox, I appreciate that. Forbesilla says, happy Tuesday, John. Still love you, Oz. <laughs> very nice of you. Moore says, used up my messages for the day in the pre-show, so just going to send some support. Thank you, that's very nice of you, I appreciate that. I uh, love the pre-show audience. Uh, Sono Jam says, I'm gonna drop a super chat and hopes this get, gets read. There's a great video on YouTube on why Afghanistan is nearly impossible to conquer. Y'all dragons should watch it. It's greatly informative and relevant to the seven days thing. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'll have to search a bit, but I do appreciate that. Um, you know, it, It's gonna be required watching for the next empire. I don't know, is China gonna try to invade and occupy Afghanistan for a few decades or something? I guess yeah. they're next up. Anyway, Franklin Sharp Slicer says, England tried three times and failed. Soviets tried then bailed. Afghanistan is a sovereign nation, whether or not effective. Perhaps we should try borrowing Star Trek's prime directive. Was for the cause. Thank you. Yes, they're pre-warp civilization, so we should not get involved. Of course, neither are we. Uh, Tyler says, water is wet, the sky is blue, and there's nothing the media loves more than war and military operations. Things that are obvious, at least to me. Which is true. Although, like, here's the thing. So they're they're all being like, how could you left the weapons? You didn't get people out. And I will admit, maybe I'm wrong. I don't casually watch Fox News. But if you watch Fox News, uh, do you remember them spending the last six months talking about how we need to be doing this? And here's how you get the guns out. And I really hope we bring a lot of refugees over from Afghanistan. Does anybody remember Fox doing that? I don't. I feel like they're kind of just making that up after the fact. Anyway, on Twitch, Lieutenant McMagee gave 10 tier one subs. Thank you for that, participating in a level five hype train. Pretty awesome. Okay, let's see. Um, fat guy named Tiny says, uh, the war served three purposes. Massive wealth transfer to the military industrial complex, massive arms transfer to the Taliban, protect the opium supply for opioid manufacturers. That's it, it was a glaring success, seemingly. Uh, Tara Peterson says, hi, John, it's my birthday and I'm exactly where I want to be watching you and eating tacos. I'm a proud progressive now armed with facts all because of TYT and the damage report. Thank you, thank you and share the tacos, please. Uh, Greta says, nice job Biden ending the war. Yeah, you know, like obviously there are issues with it. And I, and I but I am kind of surprised if you go back to us talking about months ago, Biden announcing the withdrawal. I'm pretty sure you'll find me being really suspicious about it actually happening. I don't remember for sure, but I kind of feel like that's what we were saying. And he actually did it. That seems good. Where's that political bravery for virtually any other domestic concern? Canceling student loan debt, he's looking into it and everything. Like, I wanna see that sort of bravery. I like brave Biden. Anyway, um, oh, Sexy Melody, I did see your message. Avenger, Avenger Dragon uh, heard about the loss of your father. That is terrible, I'm so sorry. Absolutely tragic thing that happened. Um, you know, hope that the the show at least proves to be a bit of a distraction for you. Um, really sorry to hear that news. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, GYPZI Rock says, John, want views? Claim global warming is God's wrath. Talk like a crazy person. Add syllables for no reason. Grift money, you'll attract thousands. I'm considering it. I'll look into it. Maybe I'm gonna give it another year, honest, and then uh, move into the grift game. But anyway, uh, we've got more news coming up for you. And uh, we'll of course get to more of your comments in the next break. Uh, but for now, uh, we'll see you on the other side of this. Okay, everybody, hold on to your butts. We're about to launch into this video. Okay, so that is uh, uh, unfortunately Congressman Madison Cawthorn being asked about uh, those who were arrested following their participation in the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And he says that they are political hostages, hostages. It seems like it has a specific definition. 
He doesn't really expand on it, but he knows his audience. We gotta give him that, Wozniak. He knows what those people in that crowd wanna hear. And um, we're gonna give you in a little bit some of what he was saying about those who participated on January 6th in the immediate aftermath of it. But that was a long time ago. Now it's all about, yes, it is political persecution. These are political prisoners. Um, Wazi, I know that you have a long history of talking about actual political prisoners in a number of different, a number of other countries. Are there any differences with what we're seeing with those arrested after the sixth? <laughs> I think there's some slight differences in the sense that uh, it's not like Joe Biden ordered these people to be arrested for just being um, in opposition to his presidency. Uh, these people attacked police officers with spiked baseball bats, right? Like crimes were actually committed by these people. A political prisoner is just somebody who opposes the ruling party and therefore is put in jail. Like that's, that's not yeah. what happened here. Um, people like this clown congressman get to oppose Biden's presidency, get to oppose its legitimacy on radio and print, on TV, wherever the hell he chooses to. And nobody's gonna lock him up, right? Because that's just the reality of the country that we live in. However, when you attack police officers, when you break into a government building and damage property, uh, yeah, you might go to jail for that. That's just yeah. normal rule of law stuff. This has nothing to do with <laughs> of being a political prisoner. That's absurd. Yeah, and it's not like it's not like you know. It's suspiciously hundreds of these people were found to have shoplifted in their hometown or something. And now they're all in DC being held. Like they were all doing very visible crimes. They were filming their crimes. They were very happy with the crimes they were criming. Like it's all there. Like that's that's not what political prisoners are about. Like man, they really love to make light of serious topics and they really, really love being victims. But anyway, um, Mass Gawthorne is an empty shell. He's just telling them what they want to hear. Uh, but he does have a little bit more that they want to hear. So uh, I, I understand that the, the audio is a little bit rough here, but really try to pay attention because this is some crazy stuff. The, the big problem is we don't actually know where all the political prisoners are. And, and so if we were to actually be able to go and try and bust them out, and let me tell you, the reason why they're, they're taking these political prisoners is because they're trying to make an example to say, because they don't want to protests going on in Washington. They don't want to see people redressing their government for leaving 13 Marines to die in Afghanistan. When are you going to call us to Washington again? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, we're, that, we're actually working on that one. I, I don't have an answer to that one right yet. But, uh, man, we are actually working on this. We have a few plans in motion that I can't make public right now. Um, but this is something that we're working on. There are a lot of Republicans who don't want to talk about this because you know they say, oh, that, that, that's too controversial. Okay, so I know it was a little bit hard to hear what that question was, but it was, uh, when are you calling us back to DC? Like we had fun in that round, we wanna do it again. And the response from Madison Cawthorn, elected representative was, we have active plans we're working on, I can't give you the details. Question was, when are you calling us back? And that's what he had to say. We're gonna have more of his commentary, but but Wazi, let's, let's focus on that yet. That they are they are eager, whether he is eager, for a second round of January 6th. That's what his fans want. And he did not tell them, no, 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 that was a dark day, a dark moment. Let's not do that again. He told them we have active plans we're working on. Well, he seems like a guy who understands what direction the winds are blowing amongst the constituency of the Republican Party. And so, you know, <laughs> These guys, it's it is the the tail wagging the dog here when it comes to the Republican base and their elected officials. These guys basically will pander to this what used to be considered the quote unquote lunatic fringe, which is just now mainstream Republican um, political figures. Uh, these guys will pander to that fringe or that mainstream, if you will, uh, at every turn. We saw it the other day when Donald Trump was like. 
yo, I got the jab. Like people should get it. And then the crowd mm-hmm. turned against him and he cowered yep. immediately. That's no different from what you're seeing from this Cawthorn clown. Like it, 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 he's going to tell them the rubes exactly what they want to hear. And he's such a weasel. You can see him sort of, his palms are getting sweaty and he's rubbing his thigh because he's like, Jesus, I'm just coming up with all <laughs> kinds of lies as I go on here. Not that anybody's going to fact check me. But he's, whenever, you know, the greatest tell is like, I can't speak on it, mm-hmm. but I'm working on it. Oh, it's in the works, trust me. But I just can't, get, you know, I can't give you any details. <laughs> it's, it's still top secret, but it's in the works, believe me. Yeah, yeah. When when I get asked if I've done my like um my you know, company goals for the year, so like, I can't speak on it, but I have active plans. I'll be telling you later on. But anyway, look, you you heard you heard the question, you heard the answer. Now you hear the cover. This is uh, his office putting out a statement. Congressman Cawthorn was referring to actively working on getting answers about political prisoners following January sixth. Nothing else. He wants due process for the prisoners and does not believe that's what they're currently receiving. Uh, okay, uh, except that that is not the question that was asked, and that's not what he was talking about. You're a liar, but good try. That's your job. Anyway, uh, the stuff that he said there was bad, uh, but he went on to say worse things. So Daniel Dale, um, who had the unenviable job of fact checking and lie and real time Trump speeches over the last four years, uh, put up a quote from him. If our election systems continue to be rigged, continue to be stolen, then it's going to lead to one place, and that's bloodshed. And I will tell you, as much as I am willing to defend our liberty at all costs, there's nothing that I would dread doing more than having to pick up arms against a fellow American. And the way that we can have recourse against that is if we all passionately demand that we have election security in all 50 states. So the election security is the stopping people from voting. Um, now, obviously, there's an issue there with the bloodshed stuff, but don't worry, his office has another statement. Cawthorn is clearly advocating for violence not to occur over election integrity questions. He fears others would erroneously choose that route and strongly states that election integrity issues should be resolved peacefully and never through violence. Well, what are you talking about? He said it's inevitably gonna lead in that direction and he would dread it, but he would be willing to defend our liberty at all costs. So Ozzy, that, that sounds like a guy who, I mean, it may not be his first choice, but it doesn't seem impossible from his point of view. Well, when your base is such that they can take your words and purpose repurpose them for whatever they feel or want you to have said, it kind of doesn't matter what this dude says, right? <laughs> like he can say anything and those people will internalize it as we're, we're under attack, the country's changing too rapidly, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, you know, like I don't want to, take responsibility away from this guy. But it's not like if he came out and said something that was completely normal or milquetoast that mm. um, his constituency wouldn't have some crazy reaction to it. That's the nature of what they do. You know, I think the saddest part about all of this is that there's no, re- there will be no recrimination for this um, amongst his party. There's no price to pay for being this reckless and stupid and yeah. just, you know, deranged. There's no price to pay. In fact, you're incentivized to to behave this way in today's Republican Party. So, you know, the guy's technically doing his job, <laughs> mm-hmm. believe it or not. Yeah, basically, you're, you, as a representative, what are you supposed to do? Well, for the most part, and especially on the right, you're just supposed to be some Twitter troll, basically. You're supposed to be, that's it, that's all they want. He's doing what he can, you know, he and, and he can always point to, like, hey, I'm not as crazy as Marjorie Greene, honestly. So, like, if they're not doing anything to her, what are they gonna do to Madison Cawthorn? But here's the thing. And and this really gets to the point Wazi is making about him knowing his audience and the cowardice. You might think, okay, Madison Cawthorn's a crazy guy. He's always been a crazy guy. So why are you surprised by this? But the thing is, like a lot of Republicans in the immediate aftermath of January 6th, this is not the way that he was talking about it. Like you saw Kevin McCarthy was criticizing Trump and Mitch McConnell was saying Trump is directly responsible. And they were worried about what the reaction would be from the media, from the parties, from the country at large. The issue is that America sucks. So the reaction wasn't really that negative against January 6th and thus the backtracking began. And I wanna demonstrate the backtracking. So you've seen what Madison Cawthorn is saying now. Here is what he said on January 11th. So less than a week after the attack, he said, I think we all have a lesson to learn. As the Bible says, a rudder can move a ship, 
your tongue can affect great change. I was telling that crowd because he spoke that morning. Um, I'm going to fight for you. Your voice is being heard. I'm going to affect change on your behalf. We've slid back our movement years and years. We've lost years of progress. It's a sad state of affairs. The Republican Party is leaderless right now. It's very fluid trying to figure out what it is. My heart hurts for where the country is at just to see people with American flags and Trump flags, people who I normally associate with storming our capital. It's sickening and infuriating. And though he said that the majority of the crowd was peaceful, he blasted the violent mob as weak minded and pathetic and said they lacked the self discipline to check their own anger and rage. I think when the president said we're gonna march down to the Capitol and I'm gonna march with you, that was a major mistake. He never should have directed that crowd toward the Capitol. The bad outcome was destined at that point. So he doesn't say as some did, Trump did this, except that he does say that without saying it. And he said that the people who did it were violent, pathetic, weak minded, had no self discipline. And then he waited a couple weeks and he realized, oh wait, that's all of you? Well, you're great. I have active plans to get you back to DC to do it again. How cowardly is that, Wazdi, to make that shift after watching, you know, where the winds were blowing for his party? It's political expediency. Uh, obviously, you know, he had a visceral reaction if his words were to be believed in real time. Because guess what? That's where he works. <laughs> He's like, I could have been one of those people getting socked over the head with a spiked baseball bat, right? So in, in the immediacy of it all, of course he was scared and frightened and called those people cowards. But now that he has a safe remove from the events of January 6th and he can now talk tough, he can pretend that he was all for it. But yeah. in the moment while his office was being attacked, he was scared you know, out of his pants. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he talked about, he, he said in an interview, he was worried that Congress people would be killed. And you know what? He should have been worried about that. It was scary and they might have been, but now he's not so scared. He's not worried about that. I mean, partially maybe he's been reassured that he's not one of those they'd be coming for. But anyway, like he's the, the spokesperson saying he's against violence and all that. Well then, okay, when he was asked about being called back to DC, why didn't he tell, the, why didn't he tell them, hey, you know, um, I just wanna be very clear here. I'm all for people uh, protesting and having their voices heard. But as I made clear a week after September, or after January 6th, there's no place for violence. It will never be justified. Where's that? Where's the strength? There's no strength. It's wishy washy. If you guys want democracy, okay, I'll try for that. If you guys want to kill all of our political opponents, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to appeal to all of you crazies too. It's pathetic. And, and as Wazi said, there's not going to be any consequences. You can do all of this. He's the, he's that he hasn't even made the most violent comments, and there's and there's no consequences for it whatsoever left in America. Any final thoughts? I mean, look, this I would just tell the audience to expect more of this, right? Uh, it used to be the case where serious Republicans like Mitt Romney and John McCain and all of these sort of establishment Republicans can sort of pay lip service and even dog whistle to a certain extent to the fringe, the, the basically the animating force of that party, um, the energy of the party. They never had to address them directly. They could be like, yeah, 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 we got you. Racism, xenophobia, yeah, 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 I know, God bomb them. Yeah, we're gonna do all of that. Yeah, we get it. You know, it's sort of, you know, shoo them away. Uh, these guys were at the at the periphery of the power center. But nowadays, they're firmly in the driver's seat of the power center of the Republican Party. And so I would tell people that you can expect more of this. This is just the new normal for the Republicans. I fear that you're 100% right. Okay, uh, we're gonna launch into one more topic uh, before we take our second break. So, ugh, I haven't talked about her in a while. Uh, Sidney Powell was one of the leaders of the legal side of the attempt to overturn the results of the uh, 2020 election. And also now one of the few people that seems to be really suffering any consequences. Her and Rudy Giuliani are basically the only ones. Her um, ability to practice law seems very much up in the air uh, in the future. And the massive lawsuits against her from companies like Dominion are still proceeding and could very well cost her a ton of money. They already have actually. 
But anyway, she is, uh, she's is. been interviewed recently about some of the claims she made, some of the basic factual errors in the what she tried to accomplish last year. And so uh, it didn't go very well for her. Let's get into a bit of it. What research or fact checking did you do at the time to find out what Smartmatic's actual involvement in the election was? Do you work for Smartmatic? You've made an allegation against Smartmatic that they stole a presidential election. I think it's incumbent on both of us to know what Smartmatic's involvement was. It seems like a pretty foundational fact. I mean, I'm confused right now about why you're here. Because you made a series of very strong allegations against Smartmatic and against Dominion, containing many errors of fact. Do you accept the fact now that the company that you accused of stealing a national election only operated in one county in LA, in California? One county, one state? No, I'm not prepared to accept that fact. I think Smartmatic's involvement was far more significant than that. Do I think they're trying to minimize their involvement? Of course I do. You said that Smartmatic owns Dominion. How do you justify such a basic factual error? I'm going to stop this interview. It's wholly inappropriate in the litigation that we're in. But we're not even in the area of great dispute. These are the simple facts no. of who owns what. No, we're done. I'm sorry. These are facts. When we are in litigation against me personally. I, I understand that. For we're, billions Yes, of dollars. I understand that these are very serious so, allegations. Thank you very much. But these are also very basic. So uh, Wazi, that looks like a person who can't back up their BS. Like it's wholly inappropriate, and I'm Audi 5000. Um, yeah, you you got to have a better ability to defend yourself. She's a lawyer. Like, aren't they the people that are good at debate and like relish really getting into it? She had no defense whatsoever. Yeah, and it's in line with what's been ha what's happened to them all across the country is they bought multiple of these frivolous lawsuits. They have gotten their butts whooped handed to them from east to west, north to south with <laughs> all of these baseless accusations. And if you read some of the statements made by some of these judges, it was just been harsh. And we're talking about conservative judges, moderate judges, liberal judges. They're just like, you guys are wasting our time with all of this crap. Um, it's This is in line with what's literally been happening to them in the courts. They've been laughed out of every single court that they mm -hmm. bought this nonsense to. And that's why she can't come up with, um, well, actually, if you look at it, you know, it's a shell company and it's, you know, it's overseas and blah. No, there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing. And so, you know, you see it on camera when she's finally confronted by somebody who's just like, just a basic question, this isn't gotcha journalism. It's just like, all right, you said, that one thing is so, can you explain to us why you would say that? Nah, I just said it, yeah. all right, thank you, thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks for playing, see you next time. Yeah, like you gotta have some defense like that. And people might be watching and be like, well, yeah, Wozni, it's easy to say that, except that the shell company thing isn't true. Like, well, yeah, but she's a liar, she could <laughs> lie. Like, I at least expect you to lie, <laughs> you don't even have that. That's supposed to be your whole thing. It just the whole thing leaves me thinking, man, Maybe I could have become a lawyer. I always thought it was really intimidating and difficult, but like maybe it isn't really. Anyway, they were able to eventually convince her to come back, either by reassuring her that I don't know they'll change the subject or because Sydney Powell likely has a memory like a goldfish. But anyway, here is a bit more of that Australian interview with Sydney Powell. After some discussion, Ms. Powell agreed to answer more questions. I'm highly skeptical of how long this is going to last. Claiming her legal issues prevented her from talking about the voting machine companies. All of the organizations who had the responsibility to check the nature of this election and to verify its results say there was no fraud. That's the propaganda they're putting out. I disagree with that completely and we have and will produce additional evidence that shows otherwise. Um, what you're describing is a massive countrywide fraud involving the FBI, the DOJ, the Department of Homeland Security, the organizations who certify elections and on and on all the way up to the Attorney General and thousands of local election officials. Are you saying that thousands of Americans participated in a fraud? 
I am saying that thousands of Americans had some role in it, knowingly or unknowingly. It was essentially a bloodless coup where they took over the presidency of the United States without a single shot being fired. Who's they in that sentence? I, I don't know who all the they are. I would really like to know the answer to that. But it's a significant number of they, and they knew exactly what they were doing, and they planned it for at least three years. You this was no accident. Do you ever hear yourself and think that it sounds ridiculous? Uh, no, I know myself very well. I've been uh, in me a long time. I know my reputation. I There's got to be a better way to say that. She should record herself <laughs> sometime. Then just play it back and see what she can learn. Anyway, yeah, she she has nothing. Like you know, she puts just because she starts a lot of lawsuits, Wozni, does not mean that she's actually one of like the Republican fighters who's never going to back. She had nothing. Anyway, I final thoughts. I too have been in me for a very, very long time, John. <laughs> I can't figure out how to get out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I too have been in me, and and honestly, um, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> anyway, no, just the, this whole thing is laughable, God, and it's like, okay, we're laughing now. Like, do, what, what is Sidney Powell gonna be doing after the 2024 election? And honestly, maybe it doesn't matter, but there's gonna be others that perhaps can't, like, do have a couple of neurons to rub together that might be able to be more convincing, especially with conservative judges. So anyway, look, this is laughable and everything, but I am worried about where this is going. That said, um, we're gonna take our second break. We're gonna be closing out the hour talking about the enhanced unemployment insurance that has already ended in many US states. Now it's basically going away across the country, but talking about the consequences of that after this. You should have to know who they is if you're gonna keep saying they. <laughs> don't say they if you don't know they. Give Only us an idea. And unknowingly. Uh, that, yeah. that was the great weasel speak I right there. Well, anyway, okay, let's see. Uh, let's dive into the super chats. Uh, May Money into Building says, Hey, John Awas and Dragon Squad, send prayers to my friends that had to evacuate South Lake Tahoe and my friends in New Orleans. Uh, yeah, obviously, you know, thinking of all the people that are that have to flee during a time when obviously nobody wants to be traveling if they don't need to. Super dangerous. Uh, Wayne Sugara says, uh, from the onion, US airstrike sends tough message to four year old Afghans not to mess with America. That is devastating. That's that's when the onion does its best work. Anyway, uh, Hayes says, uh, have you guys watched Master Ken's wheelchair defense video from the Enter the Dojo show here on YouTube? There's a few choice quips in there for wheels. I'm not familiar with that channel, but I will look into it. I always love recommendations. Thank you. Pipina says, uh, Trumpican nationalism is akin to raising an attack dog, loyal and vicious. But if you don't feed it, well, you can't tell what will set it off. Yeah, and as Wazi pointed out, like, you know, it bothers me month after month after month. Trump says crazy things, stands for crazy things, and they go long, long for it. But like when he says something reasonable and they push back, it's like, oh God, who is leading this thing? Anyway, uh, Mass uh, says, just wanted everyone to know it's my birthday. Love TDR and the entire TYT family. The Dragon Squad is one of the best communities on YouTube. Thank you, Mass. I appreciate that and happy birthday. Uh, Stoneflower Dragon says, China probably tried uh, way back in ancient times, talking about uh, conquering Afghanistan. Uh, we will see, we will see. Tyler says, there's plenty of things we could have been spending our money on that we wasted killing people over 20 years. Yeah, I mean, we could like we're gonna have this debate about the infrastructure bill. Like, can we afford two trillion dollars? Like, well, we did for Afghanistan. Like, can we do it here too? I feel like we could probably put the money together. <laughs> Melissa the Defender says, uh, I had a law school professor that would give you a long lecture if you used a vague they in your responses in class. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good policy to have. I don't like when uh, you know sham lawyers do it. I don't like when politicians do it. I don't like when pundits do it. Be specific. And if you can't be specific in your arguments, then maybe don't make the arguments. Well, anyway, Mini Morpho subscribed for 11 months on uh, Twitch, it says 11 months strong. Love you, Damage Report and Dragon Fam. Thank you, Mini Morpho. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, Bernie Baby says, Thank you, John, for being the best part of my day. All my love to TYT at six months. Thank you, Bernie Baby. Appreciate that. Uh, and that was as a result of Bernie Baby subscribing for six months. Thank you.
KK Tegan uh, subscribe for five months says happy to be a progressive from Texas. I am happy to have progressives in Texas. I spent a number of years living in Austin. Do you miss it? I know that it's slowly changing. That's what we keep hearing. And yet, as of right now, you still got Ted Cruz. So clearly a lot of work yet to be done. Bernie the Kiwi Dragon says Powell lied for Trump and now her professional and personal reputation is almost definitely beyond repair. That's one really costly fried Kraken calamari dish, hashtag hungry for calamari. Yeah, that's like those um, those Postmates commercials that starts invading your metaphors. Uh, but I feel you, I could go for some calamari. Lunar Swine says the Kraken is like Jesus. Once you accept Kraken, he comes inside you for the rest of your life. It's a very warm and fuzzy feeling. Yeah, I, there, there's definitely a religious component to the cult that they have set up and the offshoots of it. Anyway, oh, don't. Think we have time. Um, Masonic gave out five tier one subs over on Twitch. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you for that, Masonic and Lorac for resubscribing for six months. Appreciate that. We'll be back in just a sec. Okay, everybody. Before we jump into our remaining stories, um, I did want to let you know about a few things, including something I forgot to do earlier. Uh, so we had a poll actually about that right wing reaction to Biden and withdrawal. I forgot about that, but anyway, it is still available. So uh, every day more and more of the representatives are calling for uh, Biden to either uh, resign or for him to be impeached. And they're saying that's what their base wants. And honestly, I'm not surprised by that. So the question to you is, if in 2022, the Republicans retake control of the house, which looks like a guarantee as of right now, Will the Republicans impeach Biden following the 2022 election? So you can go to tyt.com slash polls and vote. I am curious about your thoughts. I think I know which direction you're gonna go, but let's get as many people over there to, to vote as possible. Also, I uh, wanna let you know about a bit of uh, content that's coming up, including that next uh, Tuesday, the 7th, uh, this is a pretty big event here, the return of Wozniak back. And earlier than ever, you can tune in on Tuesdays after the bonus episode, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 5.30 p.m. Pacific Time. Uh, Wozni, uh, very glad to have you here. What's uh, what's on the docket for the return of Wozni? Uh More food content, <laughs> <laughs> more, more politics talk, more talk about dating in LA. Mm -hmm. uh, just more fun discussion. Shouts to everybody who tunes into to that show. Uh, the people who are corresponding with me in the comments, they just make it. To me, that's the best part about doing something awesome. live via Twitch is like literally being able to interact with the people um, in real time. Because these people are so smart, so funny, um, and get it. You know, uh, oftentimes I tell people this all the time, like. When you do what we do for a living, it can feel like you're speaking into the void. Like, who's listening to this? Yep. Who cares about any of this? And so, to be in community with people, you know, who care about the same things that we do, it's a, it's a feeling that's, you know, it's nothing like it. That's awesome. No, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear the, the, that it's back. Um, at some point, uh, Brett's got to have you on Happy Half Hour. He's been doing these brackets for different types of food, like a, ma a massive bracket of the best, like salty snacks and everything. I think you got to weigh in on that. Oh, I would love to. Yeah. Um, okay. So with that, uh, why don't we close out this first hour of the show, talking about something um, incredibly important that, especially amongst all of what's going on with Afghanistan, is not going to get talked about nearly enough. But let's dive into it. One of the big things that helped many to survive during the pandemic, during the recession, was the fact that in, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, you were able to get uh, enhanced unemployment benefits. So more money if you found yourself unemployed during the pandemic. Well, uh, as of this week, that's going bye bye. The extra three hundred dollar weekly bonus is going to be leaving. That includes coverage for freelancers and the long term unemployed. After Labor Day weekend, which is coming up soon, more than 11 million people will be affected with around 7.5 million losing benefits entirely. Last week, there was a letter sent to Congress by the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. They said that cutting off the extra $300 is appropriate. They added that the White House thinks states can use remaining money from stimulus funds to help support some workers, but it's not clear how many states are going to take that up. And I think it is wise to question that because 
while the federal enhanced unemployment benefits are going away, many states cut off the enhanced benefits way back in June and July. Like from Alabama on to Wyoming, like half the country had already cut it. And look, maybe you're in a state like California that stuck around for longer, but a lot of people desperately need this money, Wozni, and and they're not gonna be getting it. As, and I'll remind you, we launch into another wave of the pandemic. The very reason that we started this benefit, the last daily reporting of COVID cases might include some backlog, I'll admit that. It's 280,000 cases and we're cutting off the benefits now. What do you think? You know, it's sad because in some of Biden's rhetoric very early on in the presidency, uh, he talked about, you know, we're killing people for not going back to work, but we need to talk about why they're not going back. It's not because they're lazy and don't want to get up off their butts. It's because the jobs that are on offer are horrible. Um, it's not dignified work. Um, but I do think this is just a capitulation to those same business interests, right? Uh, it's this idea that, look, we need to get back to people working for slave wages with no benefits and no long term prospects and at the mercy of our basically charity as far as keeping them on as employees in these horrible, under these horrible work conditions. And I think mm-hmm. that this is just a capitulation to that, unfortunately. Uh, if these jobs that were available, because remember there was this panic about inflation and you know people aren't going back to work and it's because they're getting so much money from the government and blah 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 blah. Listen, if you guys had quality jobs on the offer, trust me, people would stop taking unemployment and be like, look, I want this great career opportunity. That's not what's on offer for folks out there, and you know it sucks yep. that Biden is reversing course here. Yeah, no, totally. And and you you referenced there like one of the arguments that was used, especially in a lot of red states, was, well, look, we we totally hate to cut off the benefit, but we just got to get people back to work, so that's what we're gonna do. Look, I doubt that that was even the motivation. I don't think that they give a damn. But let's also be clear that that's not what actually happened. So, new research released in August, first reported on by the New York Times, found that states ending benefits early didn't meaningfully boost employment, but did slash spending. A sign that it's detrimental to workers and potentially the broader economy. The study found that for every eight workers who lost benefits, one found a new job. Meanwhile, it estimates that workers lost $278 a week in benefits on average, but gained just $14 a week in earnings. Their spending fell by $145 a week. In the 19 states analyzed, that translates to a $2 billion drop in spending and a $270 million increase in earnings. So, how is that for the effect on the economy when it so massively cuts? The spending, but it does stop the government from spending some money, theoretically not requiring then them to raise taxes on people who are pretending to care about the poor, but really just want to maintain their current level of taxation and don't want to spend, even if long term it's beneficial for the economy, if it hurts them in the short term. So anyway, any any quick final thoughts? We got like Yeah, oh, it's it's not like people get these unemployment insurance benefits and stash them somewhere. They go out and buy groceries, yeah. they get their nails done, they get haircuts, they do all they put the money back into the economy. Like exactly. that's the entire point of this. Like it, it's that the money doesn't it's not just they're able to pay their rent and they're able to buy their groceries. It's like they're putting the money back into the pockets of other okay. normal working people. A hundred percent. And it's going away and Biden's in charge, he could do something. Anyway, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for our first hour. So if you're watching on one of the linear platforms, thank you so much for being out there in the audience. But for those of you on Twitch and those of you on YouTube, we got a lot more to talk about. Women being attacked on the beach, just trying to walk their dogs amongst a lot of other news. So we're gonna take a short break, but don't go anywhere, we're coming back.
Welcome back to the Damage Report, everybody. Uh, I'm John Arola. Wozni Lumber joins me. Wozni, as always, it's been great to have you. Thanks for coming back. Thank By you, way, man. I'm happy to be here. We're glad to have you here. So you mentioned uh, your food takes. Uh, when you hit New York, what's like the first New York food you like to eat when you get there? Uh, I like to have some type of Caribbean food, whether it be Haitian or Jamaican food, because I can't get any of that in LA. So yeah. I usually try to make a, like people talk about pizza, et cetera. Like you can get a decent slice of pizza in LA, but you can't get any jerk chicken or oxtail or grill um, when it comes to Haitian food. So that's the first thing that I do every single time. Awesome. And then the, the other thing that I'll do is get a deli sandwich, whether it be a bacon, egg and cheese on a roll or uh, <laughs> this morning I got uh, some Cajun turkey, lettuce, tomato, you know, a little olive oil on it, you know, the works. Nice, that sounds pretty good, I can go for that. Uh, that's awesome. Um, we're getting a recommendation of uh, of Inglewood, I think it's a reference Inglewood, to the, the Haitian yeah. Jamaican food, I'm not sure. Inglewood has pretty good Jamaican food, but it's far from where I live and sure, it's I just gotcha. tough. It's tough for me to get out there. I got gotcha. Uh, we got a few more stories. Uh, right before that though, I wanna read, read a couple comments. I saw a comment, I can't find it now, but someone said, um, Oh, Pondering Dragon said, why can't people take ivermectin? We're just asking equestrians. That's pretty funny, I like that. Anyway, um, let's see, Zambul says, I'm a bit behind watching time shifted, but I just read articles saying Biden has canceled almost $10 billion in student loan debt, so yay. Uh, so yes, it's true, I believe it's like 9 billion. But to be clear, it's not 10 billion in new student loan debt that he's canceled. It is the accumulated amount that he's canceled so far this year, which is great. And we've given him credit for that. But also bear in mind that total US student loan debt is way north of a trillion dollars. So 10 billion sounds like a lot, but it's a very small fraction of the total burden. Anyway, Kenny from Philly says, Big Waz and John rock my world, keep it up. Thank you, Kenny from Philly, appreciate that. Okay, um, Nana Nikki says, my husband's company tried to get a temp agency to hire more people to work there. And the temp agency said, you aren't paying enough to hire, hire anyone. Yeah, people demand pay, how dare they, how dare they? Anyway, uh, Caroline staff subscribed for 12 months says Trump created his monster children. So is it any wonder they eventually turn on him when he says something halfway reasonable? Thank you and all your dragon crew for keeping it real. Love you guys, thank you. Yeah, Hillary Clinton years ago tried to help him. She said that they're deplorables and he didn't see it. He could have perhaps helped them and then they proved to be truly deplorable. But anyway, let's talk about some other deplorable people uh, like cops, for instance. Uh, let's jump to this video and you'll see one. Every day, a few cops decide they're gonna be the worst one of the bunch. And here we have an example of that. So uh, that is a black woman walking her dog in the uh, Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago on a sort of lakefront beach. Um, she apparently was uh, approached by the cop. She asked him to stay at least six feet away because he wasn't wearing a mask. He thought that was funny for some reason. And then decided not only to potentially expose her to COVID, but also to seemingly without any cause whatsoever, just attack her as she's standing there with her tiny dog. I wish was we could say that this is really surprising. It's like the most mundane, like run of the mill, this happens everywhere thing, but um, just totally needless. So this woman's just trying to live her life, walk her dog, and she gets attacked by a cop. Yeah, it'd be cool to say that this was some kind of anomaly uh, when it comes to police behavior, but it's not because this is the job to most of them. Uh, most of them, not excuse me, not most of them, to some of them. Uh, a lot of people signed up for the force for this very reason, that they could intimidate, that they could push people around with impunity. Uh, they love the power trip. They love to sort of exert their will on just innocent bystander citizens. In this case, a woman 
literally just walking her dog, right? Like this isn't even like, you know, cause she's not a dude. Cause we all know John, the sight of a black dude is just scary to cops, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so like- Very you can't intimidating. Even, you can't even use that excuse. This is a nice young lady walking her dog in her workout clothes. So you can't even say like, oh, she might've had a weapon or whatever. Like you can see it's just her just chilling. And this guy, you know, accosts her anyway and harasses her. I hope, you know, I hope there's some type of consequences for this. And I hope that she's made whole some type of way financially. Yeah. Well, we'll see about the consequences. I mean, we know that he's been put on desk duty, which I guess is a penalty. I guess if you're a cop on TV, they act like that's a penalty. I don't know about in real life that that's a penalty, <laughs> but but anyway, um, I want to give you uh, some updates. So first of all, from uh, the lawyer, so this is Nikita Brown's lawyer said, as Miss Brown continues to walk out of the park with her dog and attempts to film this officer with her cell phone, the officer then violently attacks her for no reason. He attempts to tackle her, all while groping her body as she screams for help. This unprovoked attack lasts for approximately two minutes. During this time, Miss Brown's phone is knocked from her hands as she is knocked out of her shoes. He's been put on a paid desk duty for at least 30 days, which I take as just he doesn't have to walk around anymore. So that's an improvement for him, that's nice. Look, we're gonna give updates from the mayor and also from one of the superintendents of Chicago. But first of all, I believe we have a zoomed in video of what happened. So let's play that so we have a bit more context for the conversation. That's fine. Make this an official incident. That's fine. Now understand this. Please don't, please respect my space. It's COVID. Six feet. You do not have a mask on. I don't don't need a mask. I'm outside. Okay, like, I, I guess. It's pointless to try to convince people this, but like you're getting up in her face. That's why you need the mask. I don't care that you're outside and you clearly do not care about this pandemic. So if I were her, I would be very worried about the potential exposure to COVID. But obviously that concern was washed away by the fact that he also began attacking her. Now, really fast, message from Superintendent Brown said, what we do know is there was some closure of the beach apparently that preceded this interaction. And I'm done with the superintendent at that point. What the hell does that have to do with the fact that this cop decided <laughs> to manhandle her? She was leaving the beach. He stopped her, Waz, from leaving the beach when that is supposedly his concern, is getting her out of there. He stopped her from doing it by attacking her. Yeah, and a cop's job is to de escalate at all points. And if you can't manage to just talk to this person like a reasonable human being uh, and The situation escalates to this level where you're literally wrestling her. Um, You failed at your job as a cop. Mm -hmm. You're terrible at policing the community. You escalated a situation that didn't need to be escalated. Uh, Again, like you said, John, the superintendent is an idiot. (laughs) This guy sucked at his job and that's all we need to hear from you, bro. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, and and as was saying, like uh, not every cop does this. Clearly, we have to throw that out there, even though it shouldn't be necessary. Um, but far too many are perfectly fine with it, and they will apologize to these people. They'll run cover for them. They'll defend them. We'll see it in video after video after video. Anyway, we're gonna jump to something very different, but also significant. The sort of news that unfortunately often gets sort of mixed in the scrum of the news every day, but it's significant, so I want to jump into it. <clears throat> Center for Public Integrity has finished an amazing analysis of postal service, basically wage theft that was going on. It was pervasive across hundreds of supervisors and across years as well. And they concluded in the Center for Public Integrity that the Postal Service regularly cheats mail carriers out of their pay. Managers at hundreds of post offices around the country have illegally underpaid hourly workers for years. So from 2010 to 2019, at least 250 different managers at 60 different post offices were caught changing mail carriers time cards to show them working fewer hours resulting in unpaid wages. During just a six month period back in 2019, auditors discovered that managers had deleted more than 46,000 work hours from employees across the country. And it's not like they weren't discovered, they frequently are caught, but there's basically no penalties. They're rarely disciplined after doing this cheating. They sometimes receive a warning or more training. In four cities, post office managers continued to alter time cards after promising union leaders that they would stop. So they get discovered, 
the union gets involved and even then they still do it. Literally just going in and changing their time cards so that they get paid less. And in a moment, we're gonna go into how much money we're actually talking about here. Um, but Waz, I wanted to get your reaction. It's pretty uh, pretty egregious. Doesn't get lower than this, it's disgusting. Uh, these people are out there busting their humps on a day to day, working through a damn pandemic as essential workers. Uh, you know, probably underpaid these people in what they yeah. do. And <laughs> what these managers go out and do is steal from them. They're stealing money from these people. This is theft. Um, people go to prison for stealing people's money. Uh, and it's just it's just crazy that this kind of thing is allowed to go on with, again, no accountability, no punishment whatsoever. Uh, this It doesn't get worse than this. You're stealing from normal working people. This isn't yeah. some Robin Hood situation where you could cover <laughs> your theft by saying, "Oh, I'm stealing from really rich people and giving it back to those." No, like you're stealing from the people who need it the most. This is this is horrific. Yeah, like basically public service. This is one of the classic jobs. You deliver mail for people, and especially during a pandemic when we've all been relying on um, you know, uh, the, the Postal Service to do deliveries and stuff like that. And as more and more states are doing uh, mail voting, the idea that this is still out there, that there is this, per this pervasive culture of we gotta save money, overtime's too expensive, screw the workers, we're just gonna steal their hours, cannot be accepted. And the reason I'm glad that the Center for Public Integrity is talking about this now, that their research has come out and it's getting at least some press coverage is, we actually are in a period where there's been some public discussion about the Postal Service, thanks to Louis DeJoy, thanks to mail-in voting. Maybe this is finally the time where we could do something about this. And we need to, because I wanna tell you now about the money. So uh, since 2005, the federal government has cited the Postal Service for 1150 times that they effectively have done this. It adds up to $659,000 in pay. And let me just remind everyone that, uh, the only cases we know of are cases where, in theory, the workers actually noticed that it had been done. Think about how many times an hour has been shaved off here or there, and people didn't notice across hundreds and hundreds of post offices across more than a decade. I can't even imagine how much money it is. Um, but by the but so anyway, I, I hope that this is something that uh, gets a part of the national focus. We need to remake the Postal Service. The Republicans have been defunding it for a long time. That is one of the reasons perhaps they have such a focus on uh, overtime and trying to cut back that money. But anyway, just putting that out there, good work by the Center for Public Integrity. Any final thoughts, Was? Yeah, it's, I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this, it, 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 this is beyond words, man. Uh, again, no, normally your job would take money out your pocket by just cutting your hours, not actually trying to retrieve money for work that's already been performed. Like it's yeah. it's bad enough when people's hours get cut. You know, knowing they gotta pay for childcare and groceries and rent and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but to have, man, to have your, your you toiling away at this job stolen from, from you, um, that just, that sends the, yeah. the worst kind of message. 100%. Okay, well, look, uh, we are not gonna let a day where we have Waz on the show go by without at least touching base with sports news. So we're gonna do that now. Uh, let's jump into this story. As more and more professional sports teams try to go back to normal, having their games, their matches, and having people actually show up in person to watch them, um, there's this divide between uh, stadiums that are initiating mask and vaccine mandates, those who are not, and fan bases that in some cases seem okay with it, and in other cases not so much. So let's talk about a small but growing list of teams requiring either vaccination or a negative test. That includes uh, the Toronto Raptors, the Trailblazers, the Raiders, the Saints, LSU, Boston College, Oregon and Oregon State in college football, um, but some not so much. Was I'm curious about your thoughts about this. I mean, I'm sure you've been following um, the updates over the past few months. Like teams seem to be taking this uh, some very seriously, some not. What, what do you think? What direction are we headed in? Uh, 
He's going to be a mixed bag, right? Because even in the NBA, for instance, um, the Utah Jazz, uh, who, you know, they're in the state of Utah. You guys can take away, take from that what you will. Basically (laughs) never had stadium restrictions all year, didn't have mass mandates. They kind of just did what was regular to the people who are natives of Salt Lake City. And I think that's what you're going to get, right? Uh, Because of the nature of our country where we are a bunch of states and who have these sort of individual cultures, if you will. I think the Lakers Mm -hmm. and Staples Center in Los Angeles, California, will continue to have some type of vaccine mandate or mass mandate in in the arena for games. And you know, in other places like say uh, Miami or <laughs> say uh, Memphis, you know, you might see different rules and regulations. That's you know, and that's normal, I think, especially for sports. Because what, what do you think the fans think though? Like, are the fans going to be okay if if it becomes like standardized, like all the NFL, like you got to get vaccines to get in? Are people going to freak out? Um, I don't think people are going to freak out. I think honestly, at the games, people would rather not have to wear the mask. I think if you go to an arena with fifteen thousand people in it, obviously you're not afraid of the the um, virus that much, and so you know you're self selecting for a group of people. Who just the safety component of it is something that they're very comfortable with, right? Like already when you, when it comes to people that are showing up to a packed arena, I don't sure. think there's gonna be any mutiny. I don't know. Like I think of some place like in college football, like the University of Alabama. Yeah, I, I don't know how you could get all those roll tide folks um, <laughs> to to just be like, yo, massive vaccines, or else you're not gonna be able to watch Bama play football. I think that. Yeah. Might cause a riot, but again, in places <laughs> like Los Angeles, places like Portland, where the Trailblazers play, uh, you know, the Seattle Seahawks, their stadium, um, I don't think it'll be sure. a big deal amongst the fans. You know, I, I don't know if you saw. Um, I obviously I follow breaking news and sports constantly. Uh, <laughs> so didn't uh, didn't a player just get cut? Earlier today, for yeah. something having to do with with vaccines. Yeah, Cam Newton has basically come out publicly. Uh, he was cut today by the New England Patriots. He came out publicly and said that uh, he's not taking a vaccine, right? Um, which is fine, but now that puts your availability in jeopardy because of the rules that have been placed and protocols that have been put in place by the NFL. And so if you come into contact with somebody who tested positive, et cetera, et cetera, if you are unvaccinated, there are specific rules that govern how you are allowed to come back to the team. And so the Patriots who have basically a minimal financial commitment to the guy, they're just like, yeah. look, we're gonna cut bait with a guy who refuses to get vaccinated, period. It's not gonna cost us anything. Um, the Just the limbo of not knowing when this guy's gonna be available because he's gonna sure. be constantly getting exposed and he's not vaccinated and the rules are the rules. It's not worth the juice isn't worth the squeeze at that point for an organization like New England Patriots. That's true. Uh, I just wonder if like, has, has Fox News already reached out to him to come on and talk about how this is censorship and everything? You know, <laughs> you know, the funny thing about it is that specifically with the NFL, who's got a mentality of our workforce is essentially going to do what we tell them. And they also have a culture of drug usage. And I don't mean like weed or heroin or cocaine, I'm talking about painkillers. Specifically, yeah. there's a huge culture of that within the sport where guys are literally getting shot. You know, getting shot up right before games in their sure. workplace, in their locker room. Like, this is a league that's like, come on, bro. Like, we shoot you guys up with, sh- with stuff all the time. Like, why yeah. should this be any differently? Get this thing Honestly, done get the hell out of my building. Just have the trainers do it. Don't even tell them. No, obviously. <laughs> can't do that. But like, yeah, you're right. You're taking so many shots. And I think pain meds are probably just the beginning of it for some. Right, but anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, don't give anyone vaccines without telling them. Um, although I do support my my plan of just letting every kid in America get three or four syringes and just run around stabbing people. Anyway, um, you know what? We have a few more minutes left. Uh, Waz has been out of LA for a while, so I, I fear that he has missed the direction our, our fine city is going in. So I wanna catch you up with what you might have missed as we launch into this video. <laughs> Oh, wow. 
Okay, so I just want to be clear, that doesn't normally break out in LA traffic. But over the weekend was, this was a flash mob. It was like viral marketing for the Cinderella movie that's gonna come out. So you have a bunch of celebrities there, Corden and Camila Cabello and Dina Menzel. Um, the issue is that like we already have bad traffic. I was late to the morning <laughs> meeting because of traffic. Like I love Adina Menzel. Do I want to be late and get in trouble so that she can sing Let's Get Loud? I don't know. What do you think? You're about to come back. Do you want to be greeted by that as you leave um, LAX? I've got no problem with it, uh, specifically because I've, I've yet to see a flash mob in real life. I feel deprived. I want to actually <laughs> see one in person in the flesh. So please, James Corden, I'm coming back on Wednesday. Bring that flash mob somewhere in my neighborhood, please. You know what? I don't know if we if we have um, Brooke in in the Twitch chat, but I would love to find out what percentage of our audience has seen a flash mob, and because I I don't think I have actually. Me neither. I don't think I ever have. So I'm curious. Maybe we can get a poll going. And but anyway, you got a flash mob where James Corden is hip thrusting the air. I need more of that in my life, please. I mean, look, I'm not gonna turn down Camila Cabello singing to me, and I think I think Adina Menzel's awesome. I would definitely listen to that. But hey, oh, 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 James Gordon section. <laughs> so anyway, look, I want to read just a couple of tweets that that came up in real time as this was going around on Twitter. A lot of it focused, oddly enough, on the James Gordon section. So Pesky's poll dancer said, "Imagine being late to work because James Gordon had to do hip thrusts at you in a rat costume." Uh, Michael Barclay. It, like this could be a tweet from me it says specifically came to LA to get away from James Corden and now he's dancing in a rat costume in front of my car. I just want my breakfast burrito. Like if you stop me, like if I miss the breakfast menu because of your flash mob, we're gonna have problems. But I, I my favorite tweet was from Connor K. Dot who just tweeted this. I don't know if anybody's seen the movie, but a hundred percent. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Waz, uh, look, we're, we're running out of time. It's always great to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Ellie's missed you. We're, we're glad to have you coming back. Thank you, man. Miss you guys too. Appreciate you guys. And everyone, a reminder, you're gonna be able to catch Wozni again Tuesday, September 7th at a new earlier time, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, right after the bonus episode. So everyone, um, you know, uh, give Waz a, a great welcome and that starts up again. Wazzy, have a, have a good uh, have a good day, man. All right, later, y'all. Thanks. And for those of you watching at home, uh, let's see. I think we can read a couple of comments. We have a minute, right? Okay, uh, Gail referred to our earlier story, says, uh, what TF is wrong with police? I've been asking that for years. Uh, Jennifer says, roll tide dragons, roll tide vaccinated dragons. That would be my only addition to that. Um, okay, Maria Hall D, Hall D, subscribe for 14 months, says 14 month anniversary. More than a year on and still keep coming back to see TDR, Johnny Pie, and Hang with Dragon Squad. Thank you. That is a massive commitment. I really do appreciate that. Um, when they are 15, subscribe for nine months. Says hello, Dragons. Hello to YouTube. Khalil, uh, subscribe for 13 months. Says Baker's Dozen of Bezos Bucks. Huzzah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, finally, uh, Beta Ray Bob says, a little something to help so we don't have to see PragerU commercials come up on YouTube when you go to break. Thank you, although. You can support us all you want. We don't. We can't control it, unfortunately. I really wish that we didn't have those. But what are you gonna do? Anyway, uh, thank you everybody for watching. Indisputable is coming up uh, in just a few. Uh, looks like Adrian Lawrence. Of course, it's Tuesday, so Adrian Lawrence is gonna be joining uh, Dr. Rashad Ritchie. So everyone, go check that out. It's coming up at Twitch.tv/tyt and YouTube.com/indisputable_tyt in just a few. But until next time, stay safe out there. Stay sane out there. We'll see you soon.
All right, welcome, it's indisputable. I'm your host Rashad Richard, good to be with you. We got a lot on the agenda today. Ladies and gentlemen, breaking down news of the day. One of the greatest legal minds out there. We have Adrian Lawrence, author and TYT contributor, obviously attorney at law. Also during the debate segment, the bullpen, we have John Burnett, managing director of Empire Group, political strategist and New York University professor. That's going to be quite interesting. We will break down COVID related restrictions as well as mandates, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, my top story for today, a pastor and former police officer walk into a Walmart to return a $300 television that they purchased hours earlier and they both get arrested and accused of stealing the TV. You guessed it, they are both black, yes. They walked into this Walmart in Texas, okay? The return policy for electronics is clear. They were within the return policy directive. They had their receipt. They have now filed lawsuit claiming discrimination, false arrest, imprisonment, and breach of contract. Let me give you some background to this lawsuit and what happened at this Walmart. The plaintiffs are Dennis Stewart, a former police officer, and Terrence Richardson, a current pastor. They were handcuffed by the police at a Walmart in the Houston suburb of Conroe, Texas, after trying to return a $300 television last September. The lawsuit said Stewart bought the TV earlier in the day but said it wasn't working properly. And so wanted to return it according to the lawsuit. The two men said they uh, said that when they went to return the TV, a white employee at the customer service counter accused them of stealing it and refused to acknowledge their receipt as proof of purchase. They literally provided a receipt, okay? They said the associate called the police. The lawsuit said the police arrived, handcuffed them, and took them 
to the loss prevention office where Stewart was said to have broken down in tears. Police released the men, but Walmart, ladies and gentlemen, was not finished, okay? A store manager reportedly asked the men, a pastor and former police officer, to sign a paper stating that they would be arrested if they ever returned to the store. The men claimed a Walmart associate shouted at them and said, and I quote, take this effing receipt, take that effing TV, get the F out of this store and never effing come back. Now I want to remind you ladies and gentlemen, these two men who were simply returning a product purchased were not only targeted, but the employee was rude. And when they realized these men stole nothing and they were free to go, Walmart made them sign basically a no trespass document, a paper to say you can never come back to this Walmart again. That just adds to the insanity of what happened here. So I can almost understand, kind of, that an employee made a mistake, right? You got somebody and customer service, they don't know what the hell they're doing. They're messing up the brand of Walmart. But according to the lawsuit, it didn't just stop with that employee. It then continued with the actual management of the store. Adrian Lawrence, what are your thoughts here? Well, I think these individuals have a pretty sound case. How are you not going to tell me that this was discriminatory? The fact that they targeted these individuals under a basic kind of stereotypical race biased against black men, the thought that you must have stolen that. And then to essentially double down and say, and don't come back after the level of degradation from calling the police, handcuffing them. I understand why the man cried. The fact is that you have individuals who are not only one of them, a former public servant and the other gentleman who is a pastor, man of God, sitting there doing right, and yet they are treated as criminals from the jump. I wouldn't be surprised if their lawsuit is under the Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It prohibits discrimination in public accommodation spaces on the basis of things like race. And these individuals definitely seem that based on the allegations here that they were targeted because they are black. Walmart has a problem. And Walmart has some explaining to do. So in my research, I saw many accusations and even some caught on video of Walmart employees being Karens to black and brown consumers. I've seen the allegations based on lawsuit filings against Walmart for discriminatory practices within the workplace. So other employees have experienced this. So now at some point, we have to demand that Walmart answers for this systemic oppression happening inside of their company. While many times Walmart will release a, a very general statement and say, uh, we do not tolerate discrimination of any sort, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? They're not actually talking directly to these instances. And what do you think it would take, Adrian, for Walmart to truly do an about face and realize that they also uh, are protecting the culture of racism and corruption inside of their institution? Oh, you just need a good old fashioned boycott. You need people to hit them where it hurts, which is at their bottom line. That's right. And thus stop patronizing their services. Take your happy butt over to Target or go somewhere else. My God, hit maybe a mom and pop shop, but stop feeding them financially. And then I assure you, they will get right. Because what you have here is people on essentially on the ground floor who are exercising their power, their societal you know, privilege. And they're essentially treating us black people any which way they want. And the company is doing absolutely nothing about it. And as a result of that, there's no deterrence whatsoever to treat all of us with respect and dignity. And so we should not be patronizing their institutions, end of story, period, until they get right. That's right, and that's why tort law, law is so important because it does transform the social makeup of these companies, uh, the policies of these companies. And I wanna remind people, the reason why I can talk about this story, the reason why we know about this story, is because these men filed an actual court claim. Okay, if they would have simply put this on social media, this is not a news story. If they would have just told their family and friends, 
not a news story. The court utilized the right way can be a great remedy, not only in the court of law, but also in the court of public opinion. These men utilize their rights and they filed the proper lawsuit against Walmart. We have more, there's another story. Many of you have already seen this. Let me just take you first to the video. We're in Gulfport, Mississippi, Craig, and I'll tell you the biggest sign, the biggest indicator that I saw this morning about the force of the storm last night is that the mail delivery has returned. We saw postal workers going out delivering mail this morning. Just a couple of minutes ago, people were walking their dogs. They're back on the beach right now, and that's the sense that you're getting that the rain has stopped. The wind is still going there. I think we even have a random person going around. You know, I'm going to turn this way because, you know, we deal with some people every once in a while. But, uh, you know, one thing that we are noticing is that the mayor said the curfew is still in effect. The curfew is going to be going on for at least a, until a period of time in which they can go ahead and go and survey all the damage. They did get some reports of some down power lines of some trees that have fallen or at least limbs that have fallen. So they're going to go ahead and do that survey to make sure that they're okay. Craig, I'm going to toss it back because we have a person who needs a little help right now. Hey, 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 hey. We're going to check in with Shaq Bruce just to make sure all is well. Uh, there's a lot of crazy out there, a lot of crazy. And um, Bill Kearns, thank you as well. Again, we'll make sure Shaq's okay. Okay, I'm a nonviolent man, but I do believe in self-defense. This unnamed individual would have caught them hands if he approached me that way. Now, big ups to this correspondent, extremely professional, dynamic, dynamic in his job. Let me give you some background. This was on Monday morning. MSNBC correspondent Shaquille Brewster was reporting on Hurricane Ida. Now, I don't have to remind everyone how important that is. This man is literally risking his life, his cameraman risking his or her life in order to bring valuable information to those who need to know about the hurricane and the trajectory, okay? Dangerous work, needed work. Uh, This was in the Gulfport, Mississippi area when a man driving in a truck saw the reporting and decided to get out of his truck, run up and do exactly what you saw him do. Uh, We do know that this is a middle aged white man. Uh, They have not identified the individual as of yet. We are waiting on that proper identification to bring that information to you. Um, The MSNBC anchor is uh, Craig Melvin was uh, righteously shocked by what happened. But he did give us an update via Twitter, Craig Melvin tweeted, this is beyond unacceptable and disgusting. Shaq Brewster was trying to do his job on a beach in Gulfport, Mississippi. Shaq is okay. This guy who nearly attacked him clearly is not, okay? And then we did hear later from the correspondent, Mr. Brewster. And here's what Mr. Brewster said. Appreciate the concern, guys. The team and I are all good. Now, he doesn't want to become the story. That's why he's not going into much detail. He doesn't want to be the focus. The focus is his reporting. He allows the stories to tell themselves. He's not trying to be the focal point here. But here's the unfortunate reality. You have a deranged individual driving in a truck running up to you while you're working. You cannot assume this person is just going to argue with you. I gotta say this because we're living in a time where we're giving so much leeway as it relates to these white male fragile terrorists, okay? People that are just angry to be angry. Now, according to the report, this guy, this middle-aged white male, um, he was um, shouting, you know, report the real news or some mess like that. I guarantee you, this guy's a Trump supporter. Uh, he believes fake news um, all the time. Uh, and he's in that white fragility crowd, all right? Um, so we do have a better picture of the individual. Let's, can we put that picture up? All right, that's more of a, somebody identify this clown. Damn, I mean, let's figure out who he is, okay? Um, before the confrontation, 
Um, a family had been strolling on the beach with dogs, so Brewster initially believed pets, not the man from the pickup truck, were rushing from behind. So he initially thought this may be that family he saw earlier. That's according to NBC News. The man was moved off camera for a few seconds, and then Brewster had the camera shift to another angle, being a professional, and an NBC News producer intercepted the charging heckler. Okay, Brewster used his forearm to shield himself as the man walked back up to him and coherently rambled, report accurately before the producer and the photographer were able to separate the men. The heckler then left, all right? Here's what his boss said, and I'm glad that the MSNBC president, Rashida Jones, said something directly about this because many times, um, top leadership, they will not get involved in this publicly, okay? Like the consummate professional, he did not let someone intimidate him from doing his job. We're glad he and the team are safe and we couldn't be more proud and supportive of their work. Okay, attorney, let me ask you this now. Let's just say he ran up on someone from Glenwood. <laughs> And he called well, them hands. Yes, uh, definitely self-defense argument. If someone is coming at you and it is clearly kind of a reasonable response to think that they could possibly get violent as this gentleman was physically accosting him to a certain extent, then yeah, without question, that's self-defense. Uh, also, if you wanted to bring a civil suit, you could possibly bring a suit of uh, some kind of assault, um, maybe even a battery, depending on how close the gentleman got and if he was physically in contact with him, which it did seem to be the case. The thing that really sits with me here is that you know we want to capture this gentleman who rushed up on him as being deranged and sane, you know, not mentally stable. We have to realize that to the extent that racism was involved in this, that racism, these attacks, these are not necessarily mental health issues. And we just stop excuse for these who have chosen to attack and essentially um, try to disrupt the system. And the reality too is that daily black people are often adversely affected by racism all the time. That impacts our mental health, the stressors, the, yeah. the fact that you can't even just do your job and feel safe without someone coming to try to undermine it and attack you. It's just, it, it's exhausting. Yeah, I think we utilize that broad stroke of um, this person was not well, uh, this person was mentally ill. Uh, let's be very clear, and, and you know, I'm studying law. You are a well-known and defined lawyer. the The issue is, did, did they understand the difference between right and wrong? Mm -hmm. That's your issue, right? This man well, was driving. Depends, yeah. Huh? Yeah, it, it definitely depends on how we're looking through the lens if sure. we're talking about things like insanity. But this individual, they knew what they were doing. Right. You know, this person, I think uh, there's some kind of symbol, maybe it's a logo of somewhere he works. This individual is perfectly sound and capable. They knew exactly what they were doing, they were targeting him, and they decided to essentially act like they have all the privilege in the world and roll up on him. And again, if he was in the, if it was a wrong, different person, he could have caught those hands and been perfectly right. fine legally. Um, but who knows how it would have happened if the cops rolled up. And think about this, Adrian, because there was a time when people like this, right, would try to do things outside of a camera. Mm -hmm. He's literally pulling up, getting out of his truck, knowing good and damn well a camera is rolling because I believe he wanted to be on camera. I think he did it intentionally because there has been this, there has been this atmosphere around these individuals inside of their own communities that celebrate them. They become heroes to a particular segment of society. So no longer are they ashamed of their behavior. No longer are they embarrassed by the camera. They are now seeking it. This man literally sought an opportunity in order to get in front of a camera and to be accosting to someone reporting on a hurricane, a hurricane, all right. Um, we got more on the other side, all right? This is indisputable, stick and stay. While the young the Friday show is gonna be awesome, we're gonna help us over here, drop it. We became the first ever daily online web television show. No, the Constitution is the very core of America. The fact that we don't 
spy on American citizens, that we get a warrant, that we go to a judge, that we have a procedure, that we have due process. That is America. On top of that, they go, why don't they just stay at their own schools? You got to realize something. These schools suck. They want people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You ain't got no straps. You ain't got no boots. He lit these fires and trash bins all around town out of frustration. 99th most viewed channel today on YouTube. <laughs> the Shorties Award. Best web host. He passed a billion views. Voice Award winner, news and information channel, The Young Turks. Oh, another webby. The Young Turks. Can I curse? Yeah. Those of you watching on the live stream, yes, we have adopted a pet iguana that showed up at our door. Haunted version in the dark with our silhouettes. Now let's get to the best line of the debate. It was definitely the one against Fox. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we were coming. When I mean, you talk about it, when it becomes a problem, our lack of gun control is a problem. Nonsense BS story is hurting that cause, and they need to wake up and recognize that they are being had by these people. Biggest gang in America. Question is, how do we make sure that we blame the person who is dead? What kind of democracy is that? We should never forget that the most powerful people in the world exploited the greatest tragedy in American history to go to war in a country that had a lot of oil. Rolling thunder. That's what this show is. Did I think I would like to see a dictator? But if there's going to be one, I want it to be Trump. Tick tock, tick tock. Where's the line? But we've crossed every line you can imagine. We are a socialist country. It's socialism for the rich. Tick tock, tick tock. You don't have to know the truth. Just believe what they tell you. There is no bounds to their monstrous hypocrisy. Tick tock. I think we're gonna win the Senate in 2020. And I think we're gonna have the House and I think we're gonna have the presidency. Tick tock. And in 2020, we're going to clean your clock and we're gonna run you out of town and we're gonna have an actual democracy in this country. November of 2020 could also be potentially the greatest day of our lives. Let us whisper of a dream. Welcome back, it's indisputable, glad you're here. All right, we got a lot of comments. Uh, before I get to the comments, let me remind you that right after indisputable, we got the big homie deep dive with Jordan Yule. Uh, that is exclusively on Twitch, all right? In order to watch Jordan, you gotta go to twitch.tv forward slash TYT. Um, he has remarkable analysis of what's happening around the world. You don't wanna miss that. Um, uh, and tune in for his analysis on what's going on in news and politics. Uh, that always really, really precise, really smart guy. Uh, and also the conversation today live at 5.30 PM Eastern time, 2.30 uh, Pacific time, tyt.com forward slash live before the Young Turks. Uh, TYT uh, investigates a few stories, major real estate conflicts 
of interest. Make sure to subscribe and watch all of the interviews at youtube.com slash TYT conversation, okay? All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get to these comments. TYT member, next TYT reporter says, why are people of color doc, colors documents the only ones that are ever questioned? Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly O'Hara, uh, this is my poet. Walmart's making these racist rules and acting up like Boo Boo the Fool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Their ridiculous crap shouldn't bear any fruit. May they go down in the guy's lawsuit. I love it. Bars, loving it. YouTube super chat. CK progressive. I also bet. That that white guy was not vaccinated, <laughs> and that mm -hmm. reporter would definitely have to get tested. <laughs> yeah, yep. the whole crew. Bernie the Kiwi Dragon, white shirt, green trousers. It's Peter Griffin. You cracked the case, Bernie the Kiwi Dragon. All right, Cassie Meadows, uh, peace and blessings, brothers. Peace and blessings. Uh, Yoda Speed, thank you. Uh, Kelly Williams, thank you. Jacqueline Chestang, hello, Dr. Richie. I wait every day to watch you. You are awesome. Well, you're awesome also, and I come every day so that you can watch me. You see how that works? Thank you. All right. Robert Wallace says the beautiful, <laughs> the beautiful fly, brilliant Adrian, <laughs> loving it. Uh, Hawking Break says Adrian and Dr. Richie, nice. Yeah, very cool. Jim Garcia. A pastor the ex-cop walking to a Walmart. Sounds like the start of a great joke or possibly a bad one, right? Okay. Um, Pete and Rick show. Let's all refuse to go to Walmart until they apologize. Yeah. Listen, I, I agree with that. I just I just don't go to Walmart anymore. I haven't gone to Walmart in a very long time. Uh, they don't treat people right, in my opinion. Marty Moose. I'm a former manager of Walmart. Those trespass make you banned from every Walmart, not just the single store. Wow. Um, EG Art, when I was a reporter, young, someone groped me on camera. He also got my mic right on the face for it. Well, EG, you must be from Glenwood. Thank you for sharing. Twitch, um, Depressed Progressive says, does that employee have stock in Walmart? Just return it, this is gross. Um, consume shrooms. Imagine pulling over your car on a beach to get in the face of a reporter. I really can't imagine it. <laughs> Nobody can. That's, you know, who would do that, right? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let me bring you to the governor of Florida. Ron DeSantis is now withholding funding from schools in the state of Florida. This guy is for defunding children, but not defunding the police. He created an executive order that would ban school systems from creating a mask mandate in their local community. A judge just ruled and said Governor DeSantis operated, and I quote, without legal authority. The judge has spoken, your executive order is nothing. They are appealing, but after the judge made the ruling and said, you are operating without legal authority here with your executive order to stop school systems from mandating masks, this happened. He decided to defund school systems who are defying his executive order that has already been deemed to be not legal. You can't make this stuff up, all right? The administration of Florida, Governor DeSantis is going ahead with plans to financially punish school systems. And look at how petty he's being. The Tampa Bay Times reports, the education commissioner, Richard Cochran, withheld funds from the Alachua, Alachua, excuse me, Alachua and Broad County School Districts that are equivalent to the salaries paid to school board member salaries. How petty is that? They literally sat down and calculated how much these school board members get paid. And they said, well, let's let's make the ongoing penalty exactly what these school board members get paid. And believe me, they're not paid a ton of money, 
But you add up those salaries and you start taking away that money from the school system every single month. That's real money. Those are real resources you're taking away from actual children, okay? Listen, my mom who adopted me is still a high school teacher. Every year, I have to make sure she has enough money so that she can have the proper classroom. She's not paid a bunch of money. The school system doesn't have tons of money to give away. When I was a high school teacher, everybody was on a tight budget, okay? So taking away this kind of money from the school system, yes, it can be detrimental. That's number one. Number two, they decided to publicly connect it to the salaries of school board members. Now, why did they do that? Because they want you to blame school board members for them defunding the educational system in that local jurisdiction. That is their political play. Let me put up a picture of Mr. Corcoran. There he is, right? This guy who is now the commissioner of education for the state of Florida, he's a straight politician. He's not an education educator at heart. He's the former speaker of the house in Florida. He's anti teacher unions. This guy is simply a political surrogate, nothing more. Both of these counties defy DeSantis by implementing mask mandates, why? Because they were protecting children and refused to back down in the face of the governor's threat. However, there is some question of whether the decision to withhold funding from the schools will uphold, will hold up, excuse me, in court. Um, let me read this direct quote. Corker's announcement Monday came after Leon County Circuit Judge John Cooper on Friday ruled that DeSantis, the governor, overstepped his constitutional authority in issuing the executive order. Wow, that's from the Tampa Bay Times. Cooper issued an injunction barring Corcoran, the Department of Education and the State Board of Education from enforcing the governor's order. Seems clear cut, right? They still went forward with it. It was not made clear Monday evening whether the announcement about withholding funds from the from the Alachua and Broad District Schools conflict or districts conflict with Cooper's ruling. And that's why we have our legal analysts here to answer that question. Let me put up the heroes, some of the heroes of this story. This is Dr. Carly Simon, she's the superintendent interim of Broward County Public Schools. And then also this is Alachua County School Superintendent. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, this is one of the most insane things I've seen in a long time because literally they seem to be in conflict with the judicial order and they don't care about it. Let me do those pictures again. Um, the uh, first young lady that you saw was Dr. Vicki L. Cartwright. She's with Broward County, uh, she's the interim. And then the second picture is. Alachua, all right, there you have it. Um, attorney, I thought when a judge told you, you don't have the authority to do something and you decide to do it anyway, you are held in contempt of the judicial order. What am I missing here? Uh, that generally can very much be the case, but if you do alter your behavior in a slight way, which may be uh, essentially what DeSantis is doing here, you can at least reasonably argue to the court that, hey, I'm not doing exactly what you told me not to do. But I think what we're really seeing too is the fact that De, um, DeSantis is harming everyone around him. Like you yeah. absolutely are right in terms of his pettiness. The fact that he harms teachers, these school board members, they're paid an average of $36,000 annually, and they receive about roughly $10,000 in benefits. So you're talking about people who are not making a lot of money. And the fact that this also harms students, which is pretty big in Florida because Florida ranks, I believe about third in the nation when it comes to K through 12 achievement. It's been doing very well. If you think that this won't set individuals back, set students back, Come on now, Florida is one of the nation's pandemic hotspots. Yet still so many individuals there think that, hey, 
society should be doing less. There should be fewer restrictions to, to control the virus. And as a result, kids are getting sick. It just seems that logic left a long time ago when we're talking about Florida and the way DeSantis is running the show there. And you have to really ask yourself, is this person here to actually lead and govern? Or is he just trying to lead us all into an early grave? Very well said. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a In Sunday? You're going to feel free. Back off! I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. You gotta just do that. Yeah, it does. Look at that. Boing. <laughs> look, look. Boing. <laughs> I want to let you know how you made me feel about when you were touching my hair and when you said who has hair like that and when you were like bling, I felt like it was offensive, hurtful, and racist. I, I, mean, no, I mean, no, listen. Cute. I love you. I, I, I get it, but you're not supposed to touch it without permission. You hear what I'm saying? Oh, baby, I'm black. You're not black. Yes, I am. You're not. I have been, yes, I am. You're not. I have just like, listen, let me tell you something. Yeah. You're not. When I went to middle school? No. Yes. No, no. Seventh no. grade? You are not black. Okay. You can't tell oh, me. You're recording this too. Hi. Accept it because. You don't accept my apology? I don't. I don't. You just said. Honey, you just, I did not mean to offend you. You did. Here, here. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I didn't mean that for me. I didn't even try to say you have to explain to a grown woman that you don't go around and pet black people like your animal, like your pet. Somebody has to explain this to you. The individuals here have not been confirmed as far as identity is concerned, um, but it happens. Now, we have seen instances of this happening to black women and Adrian can talk more about that. Um, but it does also happen to black men. Um, I've had that attempt happen to me before. Um, a white female wanting to touch my waves, my hair texture without permission. Now, what if a black male walked up to her and started caressing her hair, wanting to feel the texture? You see how that doesn't work the other way? Okay, uh, Adrian, a teachable moment for this Karen, right? And maybe yes. for others. And you would think at her age that she shouldn't need to be taught that lesson that you don't pet people as they are animals or oddities or something that should be on a circus display or exhibit. But that's exactly what's communicated when white people often come up and want to touch your hair or to inspect you in some way as though you are some creature as opposed to a person. And the fact is that too many people also respond when they are called out or when you just voice and communicate your feelings that they say no, it can't be that way. This could not be racism at all. And then on top of that, for her to unleash what the white woman tears I got to see, get out of here with that. That's self focus, that is turning the narrative back on yourself and thus you become the victim when really you victimize someone else. I really suggest that people maybe stop talking, educate themselves, listen a little, learn a little and stop being low key racist and then denying it and making yourself the center of attention. And what the hell happened in middle school that made you black? Remember, oh, did, she said, oh, no, 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 I'm black. No, no, because in middle school. Mm -hmm. what? I was the minority. I hear that all the time. And I teach um, anti racism courses as well as anti sexism and so on. And I hear that too often where people want to flex on this proximity to blackness or proximity to people of color. I do not care if your friend is black. I don't care if your mom is black or even your dog is black. I don't care. If you are not black, you're not black. I don't care how quick. Uh, you were raised or what kind of experiences you've had, it is not yours to proclaim. Also, you do not get to essentially denigrate someone and saying that their feelings are wrong. I'm just seeing yeah. that kind of behavior, all of it. I prefer even a contentious interaction as opposed to <laughs> things like that. And you made a remarkable point about the self victimization role here, right? You do something offensive, but now we have to coddle you because all of a sudden, you're teary eyed about it, right? And we need to now say, no, 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 they're there. It'll be okay.
All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. We are on to something that is going to be amazing. But what we need is your help. The number one problem is there's too much power in too few hands. Every single problem that we have can be traced back to dark money. They take large donors, they serve large donors. So these handful of gatekeepers try to dictate everything. Like all of you already know, they don't work for you. They work for their donors. So fire them and hire people who will only work for you that say no corporate back money. We are going to change the way we elect candidates in this country. Uncorrupted Democrats, we're gonna fight for the issues and win on policy. This is incredibly personal. We need free health care for everyone. We're fighting for $15 minimum wage, single payer health care, debt free college, and we are gonna get money out of politics once and for all. I've taken a public pledge not to accept any corporate money. Because the last thing we're gonna do is go into another presidential election and run a corporatist against a populist candidate. At some point, the buck needs to stop and it's gonna stop with us. It's gonna stop with Justice Democrats. So who are we? People who do not take corporate PAC money. We're relying on small donors. 99.9% .9 of our contributions came from people. You're a Justice Democrat, so you don't take any corporate PAC money. I'm not influenced by money. As a Justice Democrat, <laughs> I made that pledge. That's not a betting. Absolutely not. I will go to Congress unbossed and unbossed. We try to create a government which works for all of us. That is what America is about, and that's what a representative democracy should be about. We are just getting warmed up here. Vote for uncorrupted Democrats. The fight starts now, it starts today, and it starts with you. I've been honest with him. Like, yeah, I was upset with him, and I should have done it. But instead, I was like, I'm just trying to protect my engagement ring. <laughs> Did you know that more than 20% of the world's oxygen comes from the Amazon? Why? Because of trees. I know what you're thinking, of course. So what do we wanna do? We wanna plant more trees so we can save the climate. It's quite literal. So that's what leads to our new partner, Plant Your Change. Um, love it, it's so easy. What they do is you take the credit or debit cards you already have and you plug it into the system. And if you so choose, you get to round up every purchase to the nearest dollar and they plant a tree for you, okay? Now you could also choose if you wanna do it on only certain kinds of purchases or only so often, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But literally every cent makes a difference here. It's plant your change. And if you wanna know more information, just go to tyt.com slash trees. Let's go save the planet together. Now, top. No. 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 Today, a terrible day for the internet, a terrible day for America. The internet as we know it is not going to exist anymore. A real dark day for information and yet another way that they're bleeding out the democracy. We're now going to have these gatekeepers of information deciding what we can and can't see and that's what scares me the most. Whether you're conservative or progressive or anywhere in the middle, this is the one thing we should all agree to. Protect the internet because the establishment is coming for it. Don't let them destroy the internet. Welcome back, it's indisputable. We got a lot of comments, let's get to it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, TYT member Rob. Thank you, Rob. Rob says, great analysis, Dr. Double R. Thank you for that, my brother. Um, Ocam's taser, has Biden chimed in about following through with his promise of making sure that money is reimbursed to the school systems? Exactly, that is an easy, easy fix 
Just get involved and just do it, right? I agree with you. YouTube super chat. Uh, Jenny DeSantis says, I look forward to your show every day. Makes my East Coast commute home much better. Keep giving the truth, killing it in the bullpen and exposing those Karens. Love you. And Jenny, I love you back. Thank you for that. Um, Peter Hamby says, Ron DeSantis evolves, wanting to be above law. Kids are beneath him from the haiku dragon. We got two, all right, um, a hairy fetish, Karen goes racist to pooch, she wigs out on him. <laughs> From the haiku dragon to Dr. Richie and Lawrence, <laughs> thank you, brother. <laughs> all right, um, made money in the building, the hair touching happened to me a lot, touch me without permission, you getting molly whopped. Also, pray for my friends um, home in Tahoe, fire is crazy, mm -hmm. so sorry about that, definitely will, all right, definitely will. Uh, Diane Raymond, thank you, Diane and Diane, welcome to tier one. Raja Harris, what in the Rachel Dolezal hell? Dragon Slayer, uh, Slayer Dragon, Oh my God. What a world it could be if people took Adrian's advice. <laughs> that's, that's right. All right, Twitch, Yeetwood Mac. It's extra <laughs> sick because they claim the mask disrupt education while they defund education. Boom, exactly. Showing you that children are just pawns in their political chess match, right? Mm -hmm. um, is it pro Dran? I'm sorry if I slaughtered that, my apologies. She must have saw Soul Man and thought that she could get away with just saying that I'm black too. And somehow think it will be done by just saying that. Let me first say this, I think it's so awesome that you remember Soul Man. One of the greatest movies in the history of cinema. Okay, I don't care what anyone says. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got more. There's a far right congressman who has called the insurrectionist at the Capitol political prisoners. And he has virtually called for bloodshed, I kid you not. Let me bring you to this GOP far right insane person, Madison Cowthorn appear to suggest another stop the steel type rally in DC is coming, okay? Uh, leading up to that, however, he decided to be very sympathetic to January 6th rioters uh, and um, terrorists. Let me go to the video, here it is. We are doing support for 535 Americans that were killed capture in from January 6th. Political hostages, yeah. make no doubt. Yeah. So this is something that we are trying to figure out everything out about. Um, there are some criminal activities going on when my office literally is sick of, we have a mock law to be able to ask almost any federal agency any question we want. And when we're seeking answers, they are giving us the biggest run around that you possibly can imagine. And so uh, the, the big problem is we don't actually know where all the political prisoners are. And so if we were to actually be able to go and try and bust them out, and let me tell you, the reason why they're ta they've taken these political prisoners is because they're trying to make an example. When are you gonna call us to Washington again? <laughs> that, we are actively working on that one. I, I don't have an answer to that one right yet, but uh, man, we are actively working on this. We have a few plans in motion that I can't make public right now. And there are a lot of Republicans who don't wanna talk about this because you know they say, oh, that, that that's too controversial. What's controversial is we have 536 people who are being held in solitary confinement for 23 hours out of the day, who are not being allowed to be able to have religious freedoms, who are having their rights stripped away from them, not being able, uh, incapable of being able to have someone come represent them. It, it's political hostages. And this is something that when I first started hearing about, I was like, no way that's going on. But my friends, I'll tell you, with the small amount of investigating we've done, it is going on. Very dangerous individual there, a United States Congressman. Uh, this Congressman refers to the January 6th attackers, the terrorists there as political hostages and political prisoners. That insinuates that someone should bust them out. Someone should rescue them, but he does not stop there. He goes on to even Talk about bloodshed, here it is. You know, everything that we're sitting here talking about, we're all so passionate right now. 
The things that we are wanting to fight for, it doesn't matter if our votes don't count. That's exactly right. Because, you know, if our election systems continue to be rigged and continue to be stolen, then it's, it's going to lead to one place, and that's bloodshed. Right. And I will tell you, as much as I am willing to defend our liberty at all costs, there's nothing that I would dread doing more than having to pick up arms against a fellow American. And the way that we can have recourse against that is if we all passionately demand that we have election security in all 50 states. Okay, he says there's nothing he would dread more than having, I guess, to kill, right? Take up arms against fellow Americans. Bloodshed is what he's calling for. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a current United States Congressman who does not have a great relationship with the truth, by the way, okay? <laughs> You can do your own independent research on that and find it. Let me remind you, he also repeated the false claims about 2020. The election fraud claims he promoted, completely untrue. He claims that Trump actually won the election and it was stolen from him. He's also anti-mask and an anti-vax guy. But you know what else is new with these guys, right? So in response, the questions to the questions about these remarks, from the congressman there, his spokesperson who's trying to do damage control. The spokesperson is Luke Ball and Luke Ball um, said, and I quote, Congressman Cawthorn was referring to actively working on getting answers about political prisoners following January 6th. <laughs> They're not political prisoners, nothing else. He is not actively working on any protest to assert otherwise would completely take his remarks out of context. Wait a minute, (laughs) hold up. The man literally said the word bloodshed. How am I, how are we taking anything he's saying out of context? He provided significant context at that meeting, all right? Um, the uh, spokesperson also said uh, the congressman wants due process for the prisoners and does not believe that is what they are currently receiving. Uh, he was not advocating for any form of legal action, only that they receive a full due process. They already are receiving full due process, the hell are you talking about? They're incarcerated, they've been arrested. Some of them have already made bond, those that were given bond, others have not. They will have a a court date set. This is called due process. This is literally what due process looks like for everybody else. Why is it not due process now as it relates to these folks? Adrian, what are your thoughts here? Uh, I think these uh, tropes that Cawthorn is promulgating are extremely problematic for our nation. Because not only does it undermine our justice system to the extent that there is justice, but it continues to perpetuate the uh, lies that really led to January 6th insurrection attempt. And it really does um, kind of reinforce a narrative that we are going to have more of this, but also that you cannot trust our election system or the justice system. And it's individuals who benefit from it most who have been supporting it forever, now they're turning on it and failing to see the actual inadequacies and deficiencies of the system. Um, And it's essentially just falsities. And Cawthorn, he's in a position of public trust and integrity. He should be held accountable for this. And you know what, I know we love this thought of freedom of speech and whatnot. There needs to be consequences because if you are in a leadership position and yet you can't even Keep your account on Twitter because you lie in so hard, you should not be able to continue to be in your job. The fact is that people are being lied to and they as a result are engaging in all sorts of nonsense that is hurting our nation. Yeah, and he's inciting riotous behavior. And when it happens, he's going to say through his spokesperson, no, that's not what the congressman said. You all took that out of context. And let me remind everyone, um, there are significant scandals that have been reported about this congressman, including sexual assault allegations, lies saying that his friend left him for dead in a car accident that paralyzed him. The friend said that's exactly what did not happen. And it goes on and on. But with all of these misrepresentations or accounts of misrepresentation of the truth, he continues to ascend in the GOP because he continues to say exactly what they wanna hear. Mm-hmm. Right, they don't care about anything else. Okay, um, it has happened. A Florida doctor, a Florida doctor, 
has been assaulted physically. A fist fight to be precise, okay? Um, Anti-mask protester appeared to assault a doctor outside of a, yep, school board meeting. This is in Lee County, Florida. The incident occurred outside of the district headquarters after Lee County imposed a 30 day mask mandate in schools. NBC2 news reporter Dave Elias, who witnessed the incident said, and I quote, what I'm seeing here is just unbelievable. Elias said during a live broadcast, I can tell you that I just saw two doctors try to walk into this building and they were shoved off the sidewalk back into the street. Let me give you a screenshot of a doctor being pushed. There you go, all right? It was a chaotic scene. Um, Dave Elias asked the doctor about the incident. Here's the quote. I was just trying to make my way to the door so I could come in and fill out a comment card. And the woman stood in front of me and bumped me out of the way, the doctor said, adding that she was not surprised by the violence because I've been watching it on social media for weeks and months. In the middle of the interview with the doctor, get this now, in the middle of the interview, once again, cameras rolling. Everybody knows the camera is rolling. A fight between parents broke out right next to them. Here's a screenshot of that fight. School board meetings, Florida, violence. Adrian, this is becoming an everyday story, every day. This is something that may happen once a year before COVID, right? Where we see it, there's video, there's recording. Okay, it's a big story. This is happening virtually every day now at some school board around America. A lot of those obviously in Florida. What are your thoughts about it? And this is a direct product of individuals like um, Cawthorn who think they're out there uh, speaking truth to power when really they're just misleading the masses. And because we have individuals who no longer uh, actually have any faith whatsoever in science and we've essentially had this administration and leadership create this level of division uh, during the Trump era where people don't even subscribe to common sense anymore. What we are having is people engaging in violence, fist fights, and getting all sorts of ornery simply because they do not want to adhere to science. They don't want to believe in any kind of change whatsoever. And this is the new America, unfortunately. It was the old America, it's just trumped up on nonsense now. Remember, this is all about mask and I'm still trying to wrap my head around something, okay? All of these parents who are in these public school systems, Adrian, they have already agreed to mandates. They've agreed to vaccination mandates. They have agreed to um, attire or clothing mandates because there's a dress code for the school. They have agreed to mandates of timeliness. Um, students have to be in class at a certain time or there's a policy that would say you cannot come back to this school or there's a suspension policy. They already adhere to various mandates on a regular basis. Why do you think the mask mandate is all of a sudden the great evil in their societal understanding. Uh, in part because it has been politicized heavily uh, by essentially leadership, largely coming from the Trump administration. And it's still uh, been created as an us them issue. Plus it is truly the reflection that, hey, we are still in a global pandemic. Also the thought that again, our bodies, each and every one of us can be a lethal threat. And when you're dealing with individuals who've enjoyed considerable privilege and been able to essentially pull up on the beach and step up on a reporter and do whatever they please, then essentially, they're not gonna wanna be restricted at all, especially when it's been made to think that this is a free rights kind of issue. Um, essentially, we have a lot of ignorant people out there and we have a lot of people in leaderships who are coaxing them to continue and to have that ignorance flourish. And as a result, we are all sick and things are not necessarily gonna get any better anytime soon. What's amazing to me, and that's very well said, what's amazing to me, I get phone calls from some of my friends that are still K through 12 educators. Um, my mom, who's an educator, uh, school board members that I know in the metro area of Atlanta. They tell me they have never seen this much parental engagement <laughs> ever. How much?
How sad is that, right? Yeah, if that's what it took to actually yeah. have parents be interested in what their children are doing. Um, wow, that really speaks to just how broken our society is. Absolutely, Adrian, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Tell people how they can follow you and get your remarkable book. How can they do that? All right, so my book, International Book Award, two time winner, Staying in the Game, the playbook for beating workplace sexual harassment. It is available anywhere books are sold and also in the TYT store. So show some love and please grab yourself a copy. I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback. It is a very fun read. And you can also hit me up on Twitter at Adrian Law, Instagram at Adrian Lawrence. Thank you so much for everything. All right, we got more, stick and stay. So a lot of progressive office holders are doing something fun. I like fun. They're doing the last two years in two minutes. Okay, we're gonna try it here. First, I wanna let you guys know about the years before that. <laughs> hey, remember we started the Just Democrats here on the Young Turks. It was officially launched on our air, basically by you guys. And then we featured AOC, we featured Cory Bush, and Ro Khanna became the first ever Just Democrat incumbent, all on the Young Turks. Now, the last two years have been a spectacular follow up to that. So let's put the two minutes on the clock and do this. Young Turks got to start back in 2002, and I think we've been an important part of the progressive movement ever since. What we mainly do is amplify the progressive voice and candidates out there. And I think we've done a pretty good job. Right now, we're currently number one most engaged news politics network online, beating CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, all of them. We're number one in total minutes watched. That means not only the number of people watching, but how long they watch. We just crossed 20 million followers and followers. 500 million monthly views. Now, why? That's because actually the country's progressive. It's two thirds progressive. And you guys have allowed us to be your voice and we're incredibly thankful for that. So what did we do with that voice? Well, let's look at 2019. We went all over the country talking to you guys and the candidates. So we were in Miami, we were in Detroit, we were in Houston, and we were in Iowa. In fact, we were all over Iowa. You guys were all over Iowa, and all of the candidates saw you guys. We had wonderful people speaking like the one and only Nina Turner at our rallies, Bernie Sanders stopped by, Andrew Yang, Elizabeth Warren. We interviewed almost everyone on the campaign trail with the exception of Biden and Buttigieg. <laughs> and we held them accountable. We even did a progressive economic pledge, and so many wonderful people signed on to that. Bernie Sanders, Warren, Marianne Williamson, AOC, the entire squad, Justice Democrats, and so many others. Now, on top of all that, we started a show called The Conversation, where we featured so many progressive thinkers, writers, and candidates. And one of the candidates we featured in 2019 was Jamal Bowman. Here comes Jamal Bowman. Then we had an amazing 2020. We hired a climate reporter, damage report passed 500,000 subscribers, Young Turks passed 5 million subscribers. We're getting the message out to more and more people. Bernie Sanders comes on in the heat of the primary. He comes on after the election to say what we're gonna do for the future. And then Marie Newman wins, Jamal Bowman wins, Cory Bush wins. And then just when you thought it couldn't get any better, here comes Nina Turner, hello somebody. And she's running for Congress as she comes on the Young Turks first. On election week, we had nearly 2 million hours of viewing with number one destination for progressives. You made all that happen. This is amazing. And thank you for those two years. What, I went past two minutes? Of course! Viewers had asked for an interview with the TRT lizard. Mr. Lizard, 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 lizard. Oh, you changed colors today. Nice. I don't even know how you feel about us. Do you, do you even like us? Well, you guys made me this awesome house, so uh, I'm kind of in your debt. I was found outside on the street, and you gave me a home. Granted, it was a really crappy home for a while, but. <laughs> But then, then through the power of fundraising, I became a person who has a multi-level Trump-style mansion. <laughs> you, you do. By the way, you never look better, man. Normally, uh, you're just green or just brown, but today you're in mid lizard, right? I, you know, I'm not very smart. I, yeah, I'm a lizard, so I don't know how the science works. I guess this is just my mood. It's not every day that thresholds like this are broken. I'm just so excited. I can't contain my pigmentation. <laughs> and now you're showing it off. Yep. Look. Yeah, I've never seen the lizard like this before.
welcome back is indisputable. Let me read some of these amazing comments. Thank you all for being so interactive, all right? Um, don't forget right after indisputable, make sure you stick and stay. Twitch exclusive, the big homie Jordan Yule, deep dive, twitch.tv slash TYT. Um, also, the conversation, watch the conversation today live, 5.30 Eastern time, 2.30 Pacific time. You can also go to tyt.com slash live, and that happens right before the Young Turks. Uh, TYT member, <clears throat> next TYT reporter, he is calling them political hostages because he wants his base to believe Trump and Trump supporters have nothing to do with January 6th. Just can't believe they have gone from protesters, even though they were terrorists, to now political prisoners. All right, uh, Mickey C, the Silver Hair Dragon. Uh, those domestic terrorists are receiving due process. Compared to minor crimes committed by others, many are being given, given a slap on the wrist and set free with minimum bail. That's correct. Some have broken the conditions of release, been arrested again and set free again. Even after proving they can't be trusted. One was banned from having guns, immediately upon release, bought a number of guns and it's still free. That's right, they actually found the guns. He blamed it on his son though. Uh, YouTube Super Chat, Amy Jarrell, thank you for that. R King Juan Garcia, my junior senior high was 5% whites and others. Even when people ask to touch your hair, it's uncomfortable, that's right. Uh, Tyler Hackner, they always have the out of context excuse after saying something terrible. And you know what they also do? They never give you the in context answer, okay? If it's out of context, okay, great. Tell me what the context was, go, <laughs> and they never do, all right? Um, Miter Sangita. Check the places where most terrorist insurrectionists came from. These places are areas where they are becoming minorities. They're angry and afraid. There's an entire research about that, and you're right. It's more about how they view their local community. Sandy L, these same people never went to a school board meeting and some don't even have kids at these schools. That's right, that's been revealed in a lot of interviews, okay? Um, all right. Zach Haravlopativ, I know I messed that up. Please charge it to my head, not my heart, okay? Uh, thank you, TYT, for being the voice of sanity in this chaotic world. Happy to have my sub anniversary while watching one of my favorite hosts, Dr. Richie, and the illustrious Adrian Lawrence. Thank you for that. Very kind of you. Mike Boy Raps, the best way to show that you understand science is to beat up everyone who was more knowledgeable than you. <laughs> I guess that's it, right? Uh, one guy literally said who's running for elected office in Florida. He said, forget all this data, forget all this science. I'm gonna take 20 strong men. We're gonna remove them. We're gonna give them an option. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, I have John Burnett, Managing Director of One Empire Group and Political Strategist and also NYU Adjunct Assistant Professor. John, thanks for being on Indisputable, how are you? Doing well, thanks. All right, so we're gonna chop it up about a couple of items. We know about the mask mandates, the debate about vaccines anti-vaxxers, school board meetings going into chaos. I don't wanna presume what you know or believe about these COVID restrictions. So if you would, give us your sentiment, your feeling about the COVID restrictions that are happening across the country. Yeah, they're happening everywhere. This is a, a in my opinion, it's a nonpartisan issue. It's more about freedom and it's more about you know, what is the sentiment of the voters, the constituents in those districts, right? So we should remove politics and actually allow those districts, the collective within those districts to determine what the policy is and not have it mandated by the government. Because we've seen a lot of inconsistencies, 
Um, and there's been an overuse of hiding behind science and the science keeps moving, it keeps changing. Uh, last time I, I checked, gravity still remains the same. So <laughs> I, think, I think we need to stop misusing the word science and just say, hey, there's a new research study or new information and just state what that information is and then let the constituents uh, determine um, you know, pretty much whether it's valid or not. And it, you know, weigh the options um, for not only their children, but you know, work requirements and so forth. So I look forward to getting into the details with you today. Okay, <clears throat> some of the stuff you said was kind of funny to me. Um, <laughs> so you do know that COVID-19 is emerging and um, it is different. You have a variant now, right? You do, you 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 know that, correct? Well, it's well to use the, the mainstream media word. It's surging, not emerging. Well, well, sir, do you know? Come on, man, answer my question. Do you know that there's a variant? Are you aware? Uh, yes, they, they they call it the Delta variant, and okay. there might be some other variants that they have planned. Correct. Oh, I'm sorry, that might actually start developing over the next several months. That's correct. Now, the dominant variant is obviously the Delta variant. Roughly 95% of all new cases are connected to this new Delta variant. That Delta variant can impact you even if you have the vaccine. But if you have the vaccine, you are likely not to die from COVID based on the actual science. That's based on ongoing collection of science, right? It's part of the process. So you put some things in here that I want us to dissect. Are you just anti-government mandates, let me start there. Or are there governmental mandates that you do in fact agree with? I, th I think going through the list of mandates in the power of the government goes far beyond the 15 minutes of this segment. But I'm happy to come back on to, to dive deeper into that element. But I think you want to discuss uh, COVID restrictions and masks mandates, right? So I think you know what is actually more telling than the science are the numbers. In the current numbers, by way of example, I live in New York City, so uh, there are approximately 3,330 new cases, and there's 23 deaths. And my heart goes out to those family members of those 23 people who passed away, but. What's rarely talked about are the numbers, right? So when you look at the deaths, right, compared to the number of cases that I just gave you, that's 0.006%. Now, those who are not really good at math, that's a hell of a lot less than 1%, right? So it is also a lot less than the height of the COVID. Uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic last year coming into the early part of this year. So yes, there are new cases, but the threat is not the same. So I don't think that we have to re-engage uh, the, the mask mandates and the business restrictions uh, and the leisure restrictions that we had last year. The numbers just don't bear it out. All right, so there's actually been an increase of 12,000 based on the most recent data from New York. You had reported at 43,400 as your aggregate account with the variant. Literally in the state of New York, you've had 55,400 people that have already died from COVID-19. Now nationally, the numbers are staggering as well. Between one to three percent of individuals that contracted based on that region are dying from the virus. When you compare that to, let's say, the flu, which a lot of people like to try to make those viruses comparable, the flu is at a rate of 0.01% death rate. And coronavirus or COVID 19 has a five times plus mortality rate. So it's very difficult to make a case that these things are the same. But let me go back to the mandates because the mask mandates are important due to the science. The science says that mask mandates or mask wearing will decrease the spread 
of COVID-19 by up to 90%. You decrease the spread, you also decrease the number of people that contracted, you decrease the number of hospitalizations, and thus you decrease the number of deaths associated with COVID-19. The big fight, however, has been with mask mandates to school boards. You said something quite interesting in your opening statement, brother. You said that you do not like government overreach and you think that local communities should be able to figure this out locally. So let me bring you to the state of Florida. In the state of Florida, Governor DeSantis has created a statewide mandate. The local communities have the legal authority to give mandates to their administrators inside of that school system. However, Governor DeSantis has said they should not have that local authority as you suggest is proper and appropriate. Governor DeSantis through his executive order says no to the statewide, no to the local control through a statewide executive order. That was just shot down by a judge who said he did not have the legal authority to take this power away from local school boards. So brother, my question to you is this, if you are a no government mandate guy, okay? It seems like we have to choose between two mandates right now. Either you are for the statewide mandate banning local authority, or you are for um, the local mandate. Because you got two mandates here. You can't say you're an anti-mandate guy. And then you agree with one mandate and not the other. Either you are let me for jump in. or against. You've been talking for a long time. Let me jump in because you know this is a show. So let me first correct you. You know the thing is, yes, the total deaths in New York State is approximately fifty-five thousand, right? But I thought we were talking about this phase of the pandemic. So so we we can always reach back into the worst part of the, the uh, pandemic, but right now we're actually looking at the current threat, not backwards. So if you look currently going forward, again, when you compare current cases to the death toll, which has drastically declined is 0.006%, which brother, is- let me go ahead, let me go ahead and update so it's very, you now. So it's very important Hold on, to brother. actually- Brother, give me, give me one second, I apologize for interrupting you, but I can't let you get away with that. You literally have more children at a higher rate being hospitalized and dying than the onset of the original COVID-19. The variant is ripping through this country and is ripping through school age children <laughs> like it never has. Brother, just give me a second, just give me a second. Okay. The reason why I brought up the school board mandates is because literally these local officials, and school teachers agree over 80% of school teachers are for the mask mandates. If you're saying that local control should run this thing, and we're talking about saving children because they are now impacted in ways they were not dur during the first wave, why do you not believe that science, but you believe the first set of uh, scientific uh, data? Let me, let me answer your question. Uh, again, viewers always look at the numbers, not the words that people tell you. And compare the numbers. Now, with regard to the, the mass mandates, and you, you're saying that my position is, you know, leaving it to the discretion of the people. Now, the thing is, yes, governors, just like DeSantis, come up with pro uh, mask mandates or uh, banning mask mandates. But you also have to look at the local government, right? The, the school board leader is also taking it upon, I think he's a male, upon himself to actually dictate what happens in that school district without listening to the parents. So, so what we could talk about DeSantis and we could also talk about the head of the local school board, but we have to bring in the parents and the voters within that district to see what they want, not just go with, the person it's solely in charge, also not go with the loudest person, right? <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. If, if we mm -hmm. really go by the will of the people, that's the direction that we should go. All right, so let's do this. The will of the people is absolutely important. And I'm not sure what school board you're referring to, but the districts that are in question, the parents are for mask mandates. Uh, there are a loud uh, Broward uh -oh. County uh, and Alachua County. You got it? 
I don't know which board you're referring to because both of those school systems are led by women. So I'm not sure what board you're referring to. And those school systems gender has no are place. the ones, go ahead, say that again. Gender has no place here. Whether Sir, women you said women. you think it's a man, a guy. No, no, it, the, the article that I read, I think his name is Corcoran. He actually passed a mandate that's contrary to uh, the, the, the governor's mass mandate. That's incorrect, that's not true. He did not pass a mandate contrary to the governor. I highly encourage you to do your research before you come debate me. Well, that's uh, according Cor- to the, the story that you're producing. What story? Where is it at? So Name the source. Story. Name the source. Uh, you, got a lot, you got a lot of papers there. You shuffle around. Maybe you'll find it if you, you know. No, shuffle. sir. You're the one made the false uh, proclamation on the show. Back it uh, up. Uh, I don't have to back up your well, proclamation. Well, that's untrue. Uh, I've well, already researched it. Corcoran, I'll, I'll Richard Corcoran. Out. Your followers can find me at IAM John Burnett and they can read the story for themselves. All right, they will find you. He did not issue anything that was contrary to the governor's order. Uh, Corcoran, Richard Corcoran, former Speaker of the House of Florida was appointed to this position, a rubber stamp individual for the governor is in sync with the governor's order. As a matter of fact, he is the one who implemented the governor's order to take money away from two school districts in the state of Florida. He is not antithetical to the governor's and order. And the, and the courts is. will decide how that how that goes, right? That particular uh, legislate uh, mandate, it'll play out in the courts. So that yeah. way, so I'm going to finish my statement, brother. The statement, the, the the state mandate, and it'll also check the local mandate. And make sure that you know the law is adhered to, just like Biden's uh, border rules were overturned, right, by the Supreme Court. So you know these things hey John, happen every day. Listen, man, John, you don't know the hell you're talking about. These happen, all right. And at some point, you just got to say, listen, man, all right. I, I may not be right about that. I may have misread that, but I'm going to finish my initial point, brother. Okay. I don't care how much filibustering you do, you're going to get these facts, okay? Uh, Corcoran is not antithetical to DeSantis. He okay. is literally carrying out the political will of Governor DeSantis. He is the office. Yeah, I may have gotten the name wrong, but but when you read the article, there are certain people that are that are on that board that are that pass certain things that's that's antithetical to the state mandate. May have gotten the name wrong, right? But the point is, <laughs> brother. The central point. There's you a, got the office wrong. A, you got the name the wrong. The office wrong. State and local. That's my point. All right, State I'm going to go local, ahead and, and finish. And it should really fall down to the parents. Uh-huh. The power is in the people, you're man. not government. Okay, That's so you feel a buster. So here's the thing: uh, the guy that you reference is not opposite of DeSantis. He is literally a surrogate of DeSantis, and he is the one who ordered to defund the school system based. On the salary matrix of all of the school board members calculated in a monthly fine. So now they are literally defunding the schools. So these individuals are for defunding schools, but not for defunding the police. You gotta see the irony in that. So that's number one. Number two, the judge has already made a ruling. It's not as if it needs to go through the court again. Literally, the judge already ruled that the original state executive order that DeSantis signed was, and I quote, without legal authority. Okay? So No, he's not able based on this judicial ruling to even have the mask ban or the mask mandate ban in place. And the school system is on strong legal footing as it relates to requiring masks for their school district. Now, I don't know what the argument about this is really is. Because school systems have the ability to mandate vaccinations. They have the ability to mandate dress codes. They have the ability to mandate a teacher's prerequisite credentials. They have the ability to mandate policy. It's called administrative law. They've always had these abilities. And all of a sudden, because of a mask, the governor wants to take away the ability. And now the governor is in defiance of the spirit and the technical ruling of the judge. Well, again, again, my central point is, there was a state mandate and a local mandate, and both of those mandates are were, were in conflict, right? Whether whether I got the name wrong or right, that's immaterial. My point <laughs> is there's a conflict there between state and local. Secondly, to your point, you know the local school board 
is not a dictatorship. We've seen local school boards around the country, right? A cave under pushback from parents not to implement um, Common Core or not to go with other things that the school board wanted to mandate. So the school boards are not all powerful, right? And they do not have the last word. That is the only thing that I'm saying here. It's left up to the parents and the voters in that district that should determine what what is right for those schools. Not necessarily the governor and not necessarily solely the school board. Did I make myself clear? Hell no, you're not clear on anything, brother. I think I'm very clear. No, you're not. When you go back and look at this again, power, you will see. Power to now, you, you've changed your position, so the governor not does not have the authority here. Um, who government. voted those school board members into office? Who did that? Yeah, right, right. It, but, but the point is. But I'm asking yeah, you, who voted them into vote office? people in, right? But mm -hmm. when they don't do what we need to do, mm -hmm. right, or we think they should be doing, yeah. then we have a right to check the power, right? And I'm letting all your in, viewers bro. know whether it's local, yeah. state, mm. or federal, mm. you have the power. Never let them dictate to you if you feel like they've gone a, 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 a month or gone down the wrong path. Right. People have the power and we should never forget it. All right, and that's great and that's true. Uh, this is a people generated uh, democracy. I agree with that 100% and part of that democracy method is to vote elected representatives into office. So the question stands, we know, the answer, to that. We know the answer ends. to that. Uh, the, the school board is voted in by those local parents, right? Now, let right. me ask you this, brother. What if you as a parent or you as a group of parents, you wanted to get rid of the dress code enforcement in the school system? What are your thoughts about that? Should they be able to do that if they want yeah, to? If, if they get enough support, yeah. right? But well, how about changing parents, the drinking age um, uh, from uh, from uh, 21 down to uh, 15? Should they do that if enough parents agree well, with it? Most parents probably won't, so I think that's a safe. But bet. I'm just saying, if they happen to do that, you know, uh, hey, you know what? That's that I embrace open discussion and mm. open dialogue. So maybe that's what I embrace because that is a fundamental element of our republic. That makes our democracy strong, and that's why people right. the, the all over this world want to come to America, so that way their voices are not silenced. Got it. All right. Okay, brother. Uh, it, listen, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, uh, John Burnett, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Just remember, make sure to take care of yourself, take care of each other, and take care of the planet. Remember the truth is always indisputable.